And I would just like to welcome you all to our school today. Thank you for being here, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this important discussion on restorative justice. Our mission of the Law Journal is to publish high quality legal scholarship that promotes ethical actions, the integration of faith and reason, and social justice. And our Latin subtitle, Fides et Justitia, which translates into faith and justice, is a core foundation of our symposia and the works that we publish. So I can't think of a better topic for us today than restorative justice, a topic that really embodies our entire mission. I think in the practice of law, it's easy to get wrapped up in the nuts and bolts and the complexities of law and procedure, and sometimes forget the people involved in our work. And one of the things that restorative justice does is it really puts the person and the people involved in our work at the center of the work that we do. And that's why I think it's such an important topic for us to um, discuss today. So before we get started, I would like to thank a few people. Our faculty advisor, Professor Carpenter, he's been a great support to us this year. And Professor Shea and Father Griffith are faculty sponsors for this event. And I know they've um, worked tirelessly along with our symposium editor, Nathaniel Fouch, to plan this event. And it's really come together seamlessly. I'm excited um, about all we have to offer today. And also, lastly, I would like to thank all the speakers who are here today who have traveled from near and far to share their wisdom with us and again to participate in this. Or I'd like to invite Dean Vischer to the stage to do the real welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Uh, Thanks, Maureen. That was a very real welcome. Uh, I do want to thank you all for being here for what is an important conversation. And I also want to thank Nathaniel Fouch and our team at the Law Journal for their great leadership of this event and pouring lots of hours into making it happen. Also, uh, thank our faculty members, Hank Shea and Father Dan Griffith, who we also are fortunate enough to have as a, a liaison for uh, restorative justice and healing with the archdiocese. And to have their expert guidance putting this together has been a huge, huge help. Um, I also want to offer a brief word of encouragement about uh, the nature of the restorative justice project. I think this is the sort of work that has a bright future both within and beyond the legal academy to the extent it pushes back against a mythology uh, about lawyers that has done tremendous damage over the last 200 years. In 1820, Lord Brougham, in speaking to the House of Lords, was reported to have explained that, quote, an advocate in the discharge of his duty knows but one person in all the world, and that person is his client. To save that client by all means and expedients and at all hazards and costs to other persons, and among them to himself, is his first and only duty. And in performing this duty, he must not regard the alarm, the torments, the destruction which he may bring upon others. Separating the duty of a patriot from that of an advocate, he must go on reckless of the consequences, though it should be his unhappy fate to involve his country in confusion. We can still see hints of that mythology in many cases today involving lawyers, uh, perhaps even in cases that will be discussed later today. Back in 2002, one of the bishops of uh, the church remarked, quote, we made terrible mistakes, and they did, um, but also because the attorneys said over and over, don't talk to the victims, don't go near them. And here there were victims. I heard victims say we would not have taken it to plaintiff's attorney, said someone just come to us and said, I'm sorry, but we listened to the attorneys. Lawyers' narrow focus on the client's individual self-interest emerges from largely unfounded presumptions about the client's nature. The client's interests naturally extend beyond herself, 
And if that's the case, then the lawyer's narrower gaze does not authentically serve the client's interests. And the lawyer's nearsightedness in this regard may obscure from the client's view the implications the matter has for the surrounding community. Much of our professional rhetoric that we are pushing back as strongly as we can in this movement and at St. Thomas Law in general, much of the rhetoric is based on a purportedly unbridgeable chasm between the client and the rest of the world. It doesn't have to be this way. For example, Martin Luther King Jr.'s call to justice was about more than lifting up the marginalized and oppressed. It was about healing the relationships that are broken by marginalization and oppression connecting us all with our true natures as created, mutually dependent beings. This provided firm boundaries for the means that King was willing to employ on his pursuit of justice. He recognized the necessity of conflict, but he swore off not just physical violence, but a violence of the spirit that would degrade or demean anyone. Justice's call is not ultimately about power, it's about relationship. That's why the restorative justice movement resonates so powerfully with people. It aligns with the longings of the human heart. One foundational question that lies at the heart of our conversation today, can lawyers be healers? Put more specifically, can we as lawyers actually play a part in restoring relationships? We are proud to serve as hosts for this conversation, Thank you for being here. Welcome to St. Thomas. Professor Shea. Good morning. I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, overview of what we hope to do today. Uh, as you will hear, restorative justice is rooted in seeking healing and accountability from harm. And it encompasses a variety of, of venues and practices. It ranges from schools to religious institutions from courthouses to prisons. I mean, in fact, restorative justice, as you'll hear, can be practiced almost anywhere. We'll touch on many types today, basically exploring the personal journeys of our speakers and how they have come to be engaged in restorative justice. Our first panel, which is all about restorative justice in theory and practice, has three uh, persons. Janine Geske is a former Wisconsin Supreme Court justice who gave up her seat on the Supreme Court in midterm to begin restorative justice work. She created a center at Marquette uh, that has become a landmark for the country and candidly Archbishop Hebda and Father Griffith and I have relied on her more than any other person in bringing restorative justice to the Twin Cities. She'll be joined by Caitlin Morneau and Mary Novak, both from Washington, D.C. Caitlin is uh, the Director of Restorative Justice with the Catholic Mobilizing Network. Uh, she has recently put together a wonderful guide for those who want to have um, how do we do it in very simple, straightforward terms. It's called uh, Harm, Healing, and Human Dignity. And it's all about how restorative justice can be made practical and can be done in any location. Mary Novak has multiple roles at Georgetown University, both at the Law Center and the School for Continuing Education. She'll be talking about how restorative justice is now being addressed in legal education and in particular in the area of trauma, uh, trauma-informed legal education, something that many of you might not recognize, but by the end of the day, I hope we all will. Our second panel features, features uh, three really wonderful speakers. I have the privilege of being the moderator for that panel, and they'll be talking about not only how restorative justice can heal participants, but how it can overcome injustice. Um, our very own Dr. Artika Tyner, uh, will be uh, our lead-off speaker. She is a UST law grad, and she's now the director, the founding director of the Center for Race, Leadership, and Social Justice here at St. Thomas. And she'll be talking about the intersection of racial justice and restorative justice here in the Twin Cities. She'll be joined by two persons from Chicago, both restorative justice advocates, Annalise Booth and Monica Cosby. They'll focus on a historical approach, a big picture approach to repairing harm They'll be looking at restorative justice, not in the individual sense, but in the systemic sense, in terms of accountability for collective, historical, and structural harm. Our lunch speaker will be Jean Bishop. We are very fortunate to welcome her back. She has uh, shared her incredible personal journey 
uh, here at the law school on several occasions, which we'll, she will touch on today, but she'll be giving us a preview. This is the first anybody will have been able to hear about her upcoming book. It will be published in April, uh, the 25th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. And it recounts the really compelling story of two fathers and their path to reconciliation after that bombing. Our afternoon panel will conclude this symposium by covering the role of restorative justice in helping to resolve the criminal charges and the civil charges brought against the Archdiocese by Ramsey County, and more broadly, what has been done to address the widespread need for healing in the Archdiocese and in the Twin Cities and beyond as a result of clergy sexual abuse. We're grateful to have four uh, outstanding persons joining us, Archbishop Hebda, John Choi, the Ramsey County Attorney, Tim O'Malley, the Director of Ministerial Standards and Safe Environment for the Archdiocese, and Stephanie Wiersma, who is an Assistant Ramsey County Attorney, and again, I'm proud to say a St. Thomas Law graduate. They will appear together for the first time in this type of setting and share some of the steps that have been taken to achieve justice and create a process of victim-centered outreach, including the wonderful ombudsman work being done by Tom Johnson, uh, who will be the moderator of that panel. And then finally, we'll hear from Frank Mears at the end of the day. Frank is a victim survivor of clergy sexual abuse, and he will provide comments on the benefits of restorative justice. A few administrative matters. In terms of uh, questions, we're going to try and reserve time with each panel and with uh, Jean Bishop for questions, but we ask that you write them on the note cards that have been provided. We'll have students be collecting the note cards from uh, throughout the day. We'll get to as many questions as possible. We'll also have a reception at the end of the day uh, for an additional hour with wine and cheese, so if we don't get to your question during the, the, uh, the panels, please uh, stick around and we'll try and get, address it in that reception. Restrooms are located in the back corner of the uh, of the uh, atrium next to the elevator bank. And then one final concluding note. Uh, each of us brings our own perspectives, our own experiences here today. Some are familiar with restorative justice because you've been engaged in it uh, for some time. Others are completely new to it. Uh, my first encounter with restorative justice was as a prosecutor when I started asking people who I was prosecuting to come to law schools and business schools and and share their stories with future lawyers and future business people. And the, the reason for that was that they wanted to do more than just answer to the justice system. They wanted to make amends for what they had done. And some of those are still doing it today with me some 20 years after their wrongful conduct. More recently, I started working with restorative justice people like Father Griffith uh, here at the law school. We've created a course uh, that incorporates restorative justice. And, I've been able to sit in circles, which you're going to hear about today, with victim survivors of, of clergy abuse and, and other horrible crimes and wrongdoers who want to, again, make amends for what they did. And I wish there was some way today that we could enable each of you to sit in a circle and to feel the, the transformative power that can be created through a restorative justice mechanism. But we can't do that, but for our students, uh, we'll do the same thing today for, for all, as we do for our students, we'll do for you. You need to understand what restorative justice is about and how it operates. And we will ask you to do one more thing. Um, Dean Vischer hinted at this. Put aside most people's traditional notions of punishment, which is generally about retribution, um, giving the wrongdoer what he or she deserves. Put that aside and open up your, your minds and your hearts to a, a different way of looking at how we should deal with wrongdoing in our society. How do we do something for the, the victim survivor, for the wrongdoer, for the community, which are all impacted by so many criminal actions? And what we do is we find out what they really need what can help them heal. And that's the way you can achieve justice in a restorative manner. So thank you for coming today, and let's have our first panel come on up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we really have a terrific panel to lead us off. 
Uh, not only are these uh, colleagues uh, expert in the theory of restorative justice, they are experts even more importantly as practitioners. And one of the things that we know, those of us who have gotten involved in restorative justice, is you learn through the experience. And it is indeed a powerful dynamic that happens in restorative justice healing circles. So uh, our panelists are going to lead us really kind of through an opening primer, if you will, on restorative justice and practices, its applications, both inside the area of law and outside, and then its connection to Catholic social teaching, uh, the fact that both restorative justice and Catholic social teaching seek justice and human flourishing, and then to talk a little bit about uh, how legal education can be oriented to this same restorative justice uh, uh, focus. And then finally, uh, Caitlin Morneau is gonna speak about some of the work that she's doing at Catholic Mobilizing Network. Uh, Justice Geske's gonna take a little bit more time in this, opening, uh, in this opening question because it's very critical to lay the foundation of res restorative justice, what it is, what it's not, and, and where we see its applications inside the law and outside. So, uh, and you'll find more uh, uh, fuller biographies. Uh, we're not gonna take up more time there. We wanna get to the question. So again, welcome, and we're really happy you're here. And welcome to our panelists. Justice Geske, there are many people, including lawyers, who are people too, <laughs> who don't necessarily know what restorative justice is. I was one of those people three years ago. Uh, I had some kind of vague, fuzzy notion. It seemed kind of new age or ethereal, uh, which lawyers don't like, right? We like things that are concrete. And so there is a gap in terms of knowledge. Could you tell us, and to take some time to tell us what restorative justice is, what its focus, what questions it seeks to answer, and, and how it can be applied both inside the area of law and outside? Thank you. Good morning. It's really my pleasure to be here, and it's so exciting to see so many um, lawyers and community members and law students and professors in a room um, to learn more and to share your experiences of restorative justice. I was first exposed to restorative justice when I was a circuit court judge in Milwaukee, and I was sitting in criminal court hearing homicides and sexual assaults, and somebody said, oh, you really ought to learn about restorative justice. I would not have walked across the street for this conference at that time. I also thought, you know, I'm sitting in homicide cases. What surviving family members would ever want to sit across a table with the guy or the woman that were trying for homicide? And I dismissed it thinking, this is some liberal, weird thing, um, and, and really dismissed it. It wasn't until a few years later, because I was teaching in the prisons, that I had my exposure to a circle. Um, Professor Shea mentioned circles. And it, it is a shame you can't experience one because we get a little like we drank the Kool-Aid when we talk about uh, circles, but it really is a very experiential um, event. And for me, it was transformational in my life. And I started participating and ultimately running a program in prison um, with high-end offenders, those who've been convicted of very serious offenses, community members and survivors um, in restorative justice. So what is it? You're going to hear a lot about restorative justice. I'm going to try to give you a few-minute primer on what it is. It is really a philosophical approach to dealing with harm. And it's that broad. Sometimes, and you'll hear some discussion today that it's in the context of criminal law. Sometimes it's not. And what I like to tell people, and all of you with law backgrounds know this, that people can be harmed by something that isn't criminal. The only thing that makes a crime is that the legislature has decided to make it a crime. So if you're betrayed by somebody you're very close to, you are deeply harmed and they've not committed a crime. Somebody picked up a six pack of beer that you left out on your porch, 
it's a crime, but you may not be harmed, hopefully, as much as you are by, by somebody who's betrayed you. So we're looking at harm, and, the, and um, you heard Professor Shea talk about that there are many applications, and I'm going to try to briefly touch on some of those things. So what is this framework that we're looking at when we do restorative justice? Well, there are two pieces to it. It's sort of the framework, and then there are processes, and the processes can change depending on who you're dealing with, what the problem is, and how you best can facilitate something that will lead to healing. The framework is, off, it's easy, a triangle. And at the top of the triangle is our survivors. Um, and I, you will hear victim survivor used interchangeably. Lots of victims like to be called survivors, that they've survived um, the victimization that's happened. So I, I will use those interchangeably. So it is victim focus, very different from our criminal justice system, which is clearly offender focus because of our constitution for a lot of good reasons. But here we're looking at the victim or victims. And I like to draw circles around the victims. So um, for example, and you'll, I'll give you a little more examples later on, if you have an elderly woman who has been burglarized, she's the victim. But you will find there are ripples outside of her her neighbors, her children, her friends, all sorts of other people that become deeply impacted by what happened to her, even though they're not part of the criminal justice system and they're not, they're not technically part of it, but their lives get impacted. And you hear children saying, I'm gonna move my mom out of that neighborhood because it's no longer safe. Or the neighbor saying, that could have been me. Maybe I should move. Maybe I should get a dog. Maybe I should. So we look at the ripples around survivors as well. The second point is community. And I, my definition of community, at least the, the narrowing part, is pe people who are people and institutions who are harmed by the harm, who may not specifically know the victim. So, for example, Let's assume there are a number of armed robberies outside this building on nights when students are leaving. And the, all other students who may not know those students, may not even recognize them, have been impacted by what happened. This whole community would be impacted by that crime. Whether you come here to study at night, how you look at people, whether you walk alone, all sorts of things change because of that impact. You have crime in a shopping mall over and over again. Suddenly that mall shuts down. Community. You have sexual abuse and the ripples that came from the Catholic Church. That whole community, in the broadest sense of the world, have been impacted by the harm that's happened and been perpetrated by a number of people. Additionally, um, the third point is the, the perpetrator, the person that put into motion the harm. Excuse me. Some of the cases, it gets more complicated, who's the victim and who's the offender, but we're gonna do a simple model. If there's a person or persons who put into motion this harm, they are treated differently. And you heard mentioned earlier, there's accountability piece to it that I'm not, we're not gonna have much time to talk about, but he or she or it is treated very differently, but they have to be held accountable for what they did, and there's lots of ways of being held accountable. But there are ripples around that person as well. So if you have an offender, let's say a juvenile offender, <coughs> there are lots of people that are impacted when he or she's arrested. His or her parents, friends, neighbors, mentors, teachers, all those people get impacted. So you've really got a lot of people impacted. So the first question in restorative justice, three questions, three points, three questions. Who was harmed? And I've just named. So it can be a very long list who was harmed, who was impacted. The second question, which is really an important question in restorative justice, and one we do not necessarily ask in the criminal justice system, is what was the harm? So if you have a sexual assault, we are focusing on exactly where the defendant touched the survivor. What, what, what movements did he or she make? What body parts did he or she touch? But if you ask that survivor what the impact of that assault is, 
They are not going to talk about that a certain body part was touched. They're going to talk about their whole humanity has been changed, their ability to trust others, how they see themselves, how they interact with others. It changes their relationship with significant others. You know, I used to have some lawyers make an argument to me in, in, at sentencing on sexual assault saying, well, at least it wasn't a stranger jumping out of the bushes, it was someone she knew. They learned not to make that argument in front of me, but they, they used to make that argument. And I would look at them and say, do you have the, any idea how much harder it is to recover from assault from somebody you trusted than a stranger? You can kind of put the stranger in a box and say he or she is mentally ill or whatever they are, and you have all your, your support community. But if your support community, has been, part of the offender has been in that community, you have, find it very difficult. To, um, to be able to re get to a place that you're more at peace. All these crimes, and again, I don't have time to talk about it, all these crimes, I can tell you, having worked with thousands of survivors, are life-changing. There's no closure, there's no getting over it. Life changes the moment they've been seriously of, uh, hurt. So the third question is, how do we go about repairing the harm? And repairing the harm, um, can take on lots of different directions. You'll hear about some of that today. But part of it is, what, what does the survivor need? What do the people around the survivor need? What does the community need? And so you have those questions, but you also have the question of not only what can the offender do or the perpetrator do, what can the community do to help support um, healing? Because the community has a dual role, both as victim, but also as the provider of support and healing. So that's the framework. And so the, the two most common formats are victim-offender dialogue. That's where you sit across the table. Those cases I thought were nuts. I do those now on homicide cases and sexual assault cases. And the other is the talking circle, a Native American process with a talking piece where you, a facilitator, a trained facilitator, sets into motion a question. Everybody has a chance to do some storytelling. Um, and I just want to share just a couple of stories, and then I'll stop, um, because I want you to understand the profound impact that can happen in those. Um, I'm going to tell a story about a victim-offender dialogue, and it's, a, it's one that I did not do. Um, a woman I know out of Texas was the survivor of this crime. Her daughter was pregnant and was abducted, brutally tortured, face defaced, and left dead in, in, the, in the country along the road. Horrific crime. She was pregnant as well. And, um, Probably 16 years later, she and another daughter of the victim, therefore a granddaughter, decided they wanted to meet with one of the offenders. I just want you to know this can take six months to a year or longer to prep both people for this meeting. But one of the questions that the family members wanted to know uh, were, what was the victim's last, what were the victim's last words? They, only person who can answer that is the offender. Nobody else can answer that question. And the facilitator already knew the answer. And this is actually a taped victim-offender dialogue. And the mother of the victim looked at the offender, who was very, very limited mentally, very, as remorseful as one can be for this horrific crime, and said, do you remember her last words? And he said, I will never forget her last words. She looked up at us and tried to see us and said, I forgive you and God will forgive you. And she died. Well, you see the, 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 the two relatives falling into each other's arms, weeping. And, f you know, to hear those words, but later to express how much peace they gained by knowing their daughter was in a peaceful moment that she died. They already knew she'd been tortured. They knew the bad stuff. But to be able to get an answer that actually brought them some peace was huge in their lives. Um, I... Um, in doing the circles in prison, which is where I started it, I have heard survivors come in and tell stories about what it's like to have a gun to your head at the hands of a rapist and to be dragged into the forest and to be forced to undress and to thinking at any moment your life might be taken. And now, 20 plus years, if she hears a bang, she jumps. 
she cannot go into anywhere where they're smoking because he was a smoker and that triggers it. And they all talk about these triggers that all of us that have not been in that situation don't know about. We don't know, I, as a circuit court judge and all those cases I tried, that wasn't relevant, but it's hugely relevant for her life and the life of her children. But I'm gonna end with this story because we're talking about lawyers and law students who are in a law school. And I'm gonna tell you one of my most um, uh, heartwarming for me stories about lawyers. I, I, was, I was called by um, two lawyers who had a personal injury case on a, involving a child who died about a week or two after birth. And there was a malpractice case going on. And the plaintiff's lawyer said to me, we really would like to do something restorative. And actually, the couple are really willing to dismiss the case. They want to have this restorative justice encounter. And so um, I, met with a, I met with them, and then I met with the doc. And the doc was very angry about being sued. She was, it was, they're all women in this case. She was really angry. And the thought that they were going to tell her how to practice medicine really enraged her. But it was the only way she could get her case dismissed, so she consented to do it. And so um, it, we, we went through a long process, and one of the... Um, the, the um, plaintiff wanted to, to, to tell this doc something, so they did. They, they talked about being in the hospital, talked about uh, what happened, the aftermath, the fact they couldn't get any photographs of this baby till after she died because of all the wires and tubes, so they had a picture of her in her coffin. I mean, it was really sad. And we, so after they had told their whole story for about an hour, hour and a half, I held my breath and I warned the, the plaintiffs that I didn't know how the defendant was gonna react. And she had listened an hour and a half, and she looked at him and said, you know, you and I are never going to agree on what happens at the birth. But she said, you know, I have three children, and if one of my children had died, I don't know what I would have done. I might be in your chairs. That's all she needed to say. It wasn't even an apology. It was an acknowledgment of their harm. And then they talked about other things for a while, and it went, it went well, as well as it could have gone. The plaintiffs were very happy. Now, this is the moment I want to talk about the lawyer. And the defense lawyer <coughs> was a woman as well, and she was nine months pregnant. So she had to listen to all this. And she did not want to go into it. But after all, this test, all these statements, she said to the plaintiffs, you know, you said you don't have a picture of your daughter. I'm going to call her Jody. But... If you have any picture of her, I'd be honored to see it. And I thought, whoa. And so the plaintiff, just beaming, goes through all the files, the lawyer's files, find this picture. And we then passed this picture of this little girl in a coffin, from lawyer to parties to mediators to, to the doctor to the lawyer. And I thought, that lawyer no more wants to see a picture of a, a child in a coffin than the man in the moon when she's nine months pregnant. But I have to tell you, it was a magical trans transformational moment. And a year later, I got a letter from the parties about how much healing happened in that moment. That's restorative justice. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Geske. Professor Novak, if you could talk a little bit to, to add to what uh, Justice Geske said about the nature of restorative justice, but also to focus in on its, on its applications. Uh, we heard some of it, some of the applications in the area of law. Uh, what are some of the applications outside of law as well? If you could uh, give us a few minutes. Yeah, I'd like to, first of all, thank you all for inviting us here. At this stage of the restorative justice movement, it's moving so fast that we need this time to step back and learn from each other. And so I'm just grateful to be here. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about what is happening in D.C. and also an experience we had in Kenya. So uh, in 2015, Carl Racine was elected to our uh, AG's office in DC. That is our version of the, the DA's office. And by April of 2015, he had hired um, Seema Gajwani, who is our special counsel on juvenile justice reform. And he wanted her to implement his election promise, which was to start blocking the schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline in the district and to ensure that our juvenile justice system is focused on prevention and rehabilitation more than punishment and incarceration. He chose a woman who was a prior public defender and she had then worked in the Public Welfare Foundation overseeing criminal justice reform granting 
and she managed a $6 million grant to do that. She began hiring a team immediately, and they first went into the schools in DC. They picked two schools to start restorative justice programs, and it became very clear right away that the DA's office should not be in the DC schools. So they pulled the restorative justice program out, but they began to encourage restorative justice practices in the schools to cut off the school to prison pipeline. And right now, it is currently a, a significant practice in the DA's office, but as an alternative or a diversionary process. The hope is ultimately to make it the presumptive way to proceed in the DA's office, for juveniles at least, and they're looking at the New Zealand model to do that. Um, but what does that, it, what is going to be required for them to do that is a real cultural shift. Um, Eduardo Ferrer, who is the clinical law faculty member with whom I have the privilege to work, he, had, he says that between 15 and 20 percent of the schools are now doing it in DC, restorative justice practices, but it's still reactive. It's not constitutive to their environment itself. And when that starts to shift, they're going to be able to do it more fully in the DA's office. They did change the DC code to now prohibit schools from kicking kids out of school, which was a way they ended up in the, in the DA's office. And this, but this whole shift cannot happen, as I said, unless the shift in the theory and thinking that Justice Skesky has just laid out for us. What we do know from this experiment in DC so far is that as people are getting experience in restorative justice thinking, they're starting to recognize how much trauma is present in our children who end up in the juvenile justice system. And with that recognition comes the realization of how much our entire culture and our entire juvenile justice system has to change to be trauma informed. So they're already starting to lay this foundation to, to have a growth mindset for our, for our kids in the juvenile justice system and they're looking at the impact of adverse childhood experiences and the trauma that informs their work. So we're starting to see this movement in DA's office across the, across the country. We're seeing it in Philly, we're seeing it in Virginia, we're seeing it in Chicago. But we need these kinds of lawyers sooner rather than later to continue to make the shift happen. So I wanna now take you to Kenya in 2007 and 2008, there was an election that resulted in post-election violence throughout the country. And it played out generally across tribal lines due to many factors that we don't have time to get into today. Roman Catholic priests and religious participated in the violence in Kenya. The, their common faith tradition did not keep them together. In fact, what was determinative of who was uh, invoking the violence and who was on their side was what tribe they affiliated with. So after some reconnaissance and ground laying work, a cross-cultural team of Mary Knoll sisters, all trained in peace building at Eastern Mennonite University, including restorative justice practices, they were trained in trauma and resilience and working with traumatized communities, they began using circle processes that we've already heard about. And they started in the Rift Valley, which is where some of the most significant violence had happened in Kenya. So to address the deep trauma in the individuals and the communities, the, part, the process the sisters designed took place over six months with homework for the participants in the interim time. And the groups were comprised of folks across tribal lines, in most cases across religious traditions. When I was there in 2011 and 2012, I had an opportunity to interview the priests who had done just a priest restorative justice circle over a six month period of time. And the resu results were absolutely remarkable, more than I have time to report in today. But one cr concrete action I can say is they, they started rebuilding their communities together on the other side of the six month restorative justice process in their villages. 
um, the priests from the context there in the Rift Valley kept saying over and over again about this six month process, how important it was simply to sit together in a circle as priests. And in, they had never experienced church as a circle process. It was a hierarchical process. And they, as co-equals in their tradition, sitting together across tribal lines in a circle was transformative. So these women, these Marinal sisters, had a deep understanding of trauma and how it impacts individuals and communities. And they were therefore able to adapt their process um, after coming to understand how the specific trauma had impacted the specific individuals and the communities they were working with. So it's a highly adaptive process, but it requires quite masterful skills in those who are implementing it. Um, which leads me to um, a very important argument what I want to make today, that people doing this work must have a deep understanding of trauma and then how the trauma exposure response is showing up in the individuals and communities with whom they are working. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Novak. We've heard uh, powerful examples of restorative justice and restorative practices and their effectiveness uh, in, a, in a number of areas uh, in our opening uh, question. I want to turn to, to Caitlin Morneau, and uh, Caitlin has been doing work at Catholic Mobilizing Network and is specifically tasked with their restorative justice work. And one of the things that we've both found is uh, how consistent restorative justice and restorative practices is with the Catholic intellectual tradition, mm -hmm. with biblical theology, with the healing mission of Jesus Christ, and also with the focus of Catholic social teaching, which is oriented to justice and human flourishing. Uh, we have a wonderful new uh, handbook here, uh, Harm, Healing, and Human Dignity, a Catholic Encounter with Restorative Justice uh, that was adapted by Caitlin Morneau. And I want to give her now that question. Caitlin. Sure. Thank you. Thank you much, so much, Father Dan and the University of, University of St. Thomas Law School for welcoming and inviting me here today. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation to share, at least briefly, our stories of how we came to this work because I know that we all come to it in such different ways. And so for me, I first learned about restorative justice through a parish course on Catholic social teaching. Um, during one class, we learned about the truth and reconciliation process in the Gachacha courts following the Rwandan genocide. And um, in short, when the international courts did not meet the needs of the community, um, they developed their own processes of confession and accountability that were rooted within their own cultural traditions. Um, at the time, I had been working uh, in direct services with families experiencing homelessness and was continually faced with how cycles of poverty intersected with cycles of incarceration. I do this work because I believe that people of faith have a particular contribution and role to play in calling for responses to harm and crime that, that repair harm, heal trauma, advance racial equity, and uplift the voices and human dignity of all those impacted by crime and incarceration. Um, and so I, I feel a duty to mention that the other part of our work outside of promoting restorative justice is, is ending the death penalty. Um, and part of what we find is that in advancing that, um, that church's call for abolition, it's an opportunity to invite folks into um, learning about this thing that's called restorative justice. Um, and so today for my contribution, um, we have, we've heard so far about restorative justice as a philosophy and a set of practices. I'd also like to add the framing of restorative justice as a social movement within which, which the legal community plays a particular role. Of course, introduced in the US criminal justice context in the 1970s and is notably recognized for its impacts in schools, at Catholic Mobilizing Network, we're particularly focused in the roles that faith communities can play in adopting and supporting the use of restorative justice in their communities that transform the criminal justice system as our own contribution to the movement. Um, and so acknowledging that there are opportunities to play a, a role in supporting diversionary work, as well as bringing circle process into parishes and ministries in ways that, that build stronger relationships and play a preventative role. And on, 
on the flip side, can be sub supportive of, of victims and survivors of crime and also help to facilitate reintegration among those who are reentering society and how, how parishes and, and ministries are naturally poised to take on that opportunity. So in this work, I'm continually reminded um, in my relationships with both Catholic and non-Catholic practitioners that restorative justice is, is not you know, simply a, a program or even a process, that it's a way of being in relationship with one another that our indigenous brothers and sisters have been living for generations. And beyond the familiar attribution to individual inst instances of harm, it demands that we also call into question historical and systemic harms, including slavery and colonization and their modern manifestations that I know that our, my colleagues later today will be speaking more to. As I invite Catholics into this, conflict, into this concept of restorative justice, I find it critical to honor this history and also clearly articulate the alignment between restorative justice principles and the core tenets of Catholic social teaching as Father Dan mentioned. A few examples of this alignment, it's, I, I often find that my job is just to help be a translator between you know, terminology that we hear in different places and then putting it in, into language that's familiar to Catholics. So by asking first who was harmed, what those impacts are, we honor the human dignity of all those impacted, practicing the preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. The focus on accountability and fulfilling obligations that arise because of the harm acknowledges that rights to human flourishing and responsibilities for one another as one human family are deeply interwoven. Restorative justice understands that those closest to the situation should have participation in, if not power over, the decisions that will affect them. This is subsidiarity in action. The gospel calls us to be ministers of reconciliation, believing that healing and redemption are always possible. Restorative practices offer concrete methods to live this call in public and shepherd processes that allow such transformation to take place. Thank you to, to Caitlin. Uh, the other thing we've found is restorative justice is so consistent with this theology of accompaniment mm -hmm. that we're called to accompany another. So we've heard, uh, we've heard a great testimony of the connection between uh, Catholic social teaching and restorative justice. We heard Dean Vischer in his opening remarks talk about the fact that we have to move the legal profession to understand the interdependence of all of us together and to, to help further that, that reality. Uh, Mary, if you could speak to uh, how emerging trends in legal education uh, are consistent and aligned with, with, uh, with restorative justice practices and the restorative justice vision. And then I'm going to ask uh, Janine Geske to talk about the specific course she taught uh, and, and also put together at Marquette Law School. So Mary, to you. So my closing argument, if, if you will, is uh, today to say that legal education that moves one towards formation as well as education makes possible restorative justice practices and ultimately restorative justice systems without the attorneys first having to go be public defenders before they can move into the DA's office, for example. So here's an exhaust, a non-exhaustive list of the kinds of movements in legal education for those law professors in the room. Um, these kinds of things were not happening when Janine and I were going to law school. Um, the one I'm going to follow up more on at the end is trauma-informed legal education, but also the humanizing the classroom movement, the practicing law as a he healing profession movement, the therapeutic lawyering and jurisprudence movement, the lawyer emotional intelligence movement, which we are starting to actually have you know, week intensive courses in January at Georgetown Law on, Larry Krieger's work on law student and lawyer well-being, satisfaction, values, and motivations, the ethical professional identity formation of your own Neil Hamilton, and of course, Amy Ullman would be um, very mad at me if I did not also mention the religious lawyering movement as well. But for our limited time today, I want to describe more fully the education and formation process of 
Georgetown's year-long juvenile justice clinic, which we are presenting next year at the Justice in Jesuit Higher Education Conference as an example of forming our students to be persons with well-educated solidarity who might exercise the will to change the sinful structures affecting our world. And that uses the language of Hans Peter Kolvenbach, the Jesuit Superior General, when he came to Santa Clara University in 2000 to really talk about doing an education of a faith that does justice. So what I'm presenting here is primarily the work of my um, dear colleagues, Chris Henning, Eduardo Ferrer, and Wally Melenik before them. So the students begin to learn about the juvenile system, the juvenile justice system in DC from the moment they walk in the door. And the first place they take them is to the youth detention center. They don't start by reading files. They take them directly to the youth detention center. Then the students get their clients who are generally not happy to meet them, and they, the clients are not grateful for the work that uh, the students are doing, and our students are consistently mystified, um, no matter what their life experience is. So during the early part of the year, our clinical faculty seek to have the students broaden the ways they understand this behavior. And it's only later in the semester that the students start to learn about the impact of trauma exposure on the developing brain of adolescents. The clinical law faculty actually do an introduction to brain development, helping the students understand the critical periods of neurological, uh, physiological, cognitive, and psychosocial development. They talk about the plasticity of the brain in early childhood and adolescence, and how that makes those periods of in as in moments of incredible um, potential but also great risk, right? So if young people are exposed to positive things during those periods of their development, supportive environments, they flourish. And if those environments are toxic, they can suffer in powerful and enduring ways that impacts their brains and their behaviors for a very long time and maybe for a lifetime. So our faculty then educate them the students about how legislator, le legislatures and courts recognize this brain development work that's been done over the years in the civil context, but how our criminal context has not caught up with implementing ways of proceeding with our juveniles to recognize what happens with their brains, lagging way behind the, the civil context. They then educate how trauma can amplify the normative impairments of an adolescent brain and how trauma embeds itself deeply in that adolescent brain. And then they explore the research that shows how adverse childhood experiences increase the odds of incarceration, poor educational outcomes, poor employment outcomes, involvement in violence, et cetera, et cetera. And they then explore how the juvenile system is not built to effectively address trauma, the fallacy of the old system that Janine talked about, and they then tie it all together. They then start to look specifically at the juvenile justice system as it being reactive, using erroneous frames of deterrence and retribution to address delinquent juvenile behavior rather than probing the root causes and employing the wrong tools, often in the wrong venue, so with the courts being the wrong venue. And then they explore with the students evidence-based tools that work using trauma-informed approaches. You get the point, they do a lot of work around this. But the awareness is not enough. The students then need to intentionally incorporate this into their mental models. And this happens pretty quickly in conversation with their clinical faculty. They do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with the students, and it's only then that the students start applying this knowledge in the work with their juvenile clients. And as the students open up to the juvenile's trauma exposure, they really start to learn, uh, and really start to learn about their lives and their struggles. Our students start to empathize with the clients, and they grow in seeing them more as more full human beings. And almost at the same time, of course, the disdain, their disdain grows for the system 
that they now see so often punishes their clients simply, simply be, for being poor and hungry and traumatized. And this leads to a very important point in our students' formation and our work as clinical faculty and chaplains to help them sit in that distress and grow a tolerance for it. Because if they can't, they can't accompany their students, I mean their, their clients. And we have some students who don't have a lot of distress tolerance capacity and so we have to grow that for them. And of course the students begin to grow in their own trauma exposure response due to secondary trauma that they start experiencing. When they open up themselves, they then open themselves up to secondary trauma. So just to remind you, if you are unfamiliar with that term, secondary trauma is the emotional distress that results when an individual hears about firsthand traumatic ex experiences of another. So usually at the end of the first <coughs> semester or the beginning of the second, the clinical psychologist and I come in to educate the students around secondary trauma, both from an emotional perspective and a meaning-making perspective, and I do the meaning-making part, which includes worldviews of which religious constructs are very operative if they are traditionally um, affiliated, but we have got so many religiously unaffiliated students these days that we've had to work beyond religious constructs to help them explore worldviews. But it's at this point that the students are really resistant to naming their own secondary trauma because they've so started to em um, empathize with their, their clients. So they start to do what the clinical psychologist and I talk about, the suffering Olympics. Like, I'm not suffering as much as my client is, so I shouldn't pay attention to myself. I shouldn't do self-care. My trauma is not compared to theirs. And so he and I then begin to do the deep work with them, one-on-one, -on -one, to help them start to understand how they're working with their own secondary trauma helps them prepare to do this work for the long haul. So I want to reiterate the argument that I made at the, um, in the first time I spoke, that legal, legal education that moves to one that includes formation makes possible restorative justice practices and ultimately restorative justice systems without having to go work on the other side and then get burned out and then come back. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Janine, you've been not only a pioneer in the area of restorative justice, but also a pioneer in the area of, of its application and integration into legal education. And, and Mary has spoken about one aspect of that. Uh, if you could focus on your course and the experiential learning and how that can help form empathetic lawyers uh, who can bridge that gap and, and demonstrate the reality of the interdependence that we all uh, experience. After I um, had this transformation um, about restorative justice, I did that work as my pro bono work for a number of years. And I was interim dean at the law school for a year. And then when that ended, <clears throat> um, because I wanted to get back um, into my work, um, I asked the dean at the law school a number of years ago, over 10 years ago, whether we could start a restorative justice initiative at the law school. Because I was finding, um, first of all, this, I really see the work as vocational, and it's very much intertwined with my Catholic faith. But um, I, I see students looking for meaning and me looking for those experiences. As a pragmatic matter, <coughs> our clinics at the law school um, where there is direct representation can only occur in the third year because that's what our, I don't know what you have a student practice rule, but so I could offer this clinic at the second year. Um, and the people that were going into the prosecutor's clinic and, and the public defender's clinic and other of those clinics um, could take this if they wanted or others could take it and um, learn about restorative justice. Um, and trauma-informed care, which is become very important. Let me just do an aside. If any of you are interested, if you go to Marquette Law School and do a little advertising here for free, um, there is a restorative justice initiative page, and we've done two circles that you can watch on, on both the sexual abuse, which we did almost 
12 years ago, I think. And there's one we did last year because we did um, a trauma and restorative justice conference last year, and it's called Torn by Trauma. And there's a lot of secondary um, victimization of trauma in that film by social workers and other people working with people with trauma. Um, but I wanted law students to have all these experiences because I believe whether you're going into criminal law or civil law or be a judge or whatever your role is or in business, these practices in information help you be better at your profession. And I can tell you from my experience and all my students' experiences, you'll love your profession more than you do now because it is such rewarding work to be able to help people through these processes. So um, I, you know, I, I taught a course, and the course is still there, that um, sort of understanding restorative justice, and I too had people being released from prison come talk to my class, and also having um, survivors come in and talk, and then I slowly integrated the students into the prison program. Mm -hmm. They started running some juvenile programs in juvenile detention facilities, um, doing circle work with the kids, which was completely different, working with women um, who are incarcerated, which is a whole different experience. And that's why all of this has to be adapted and thought about. It's not something you can slap together a cookie cutter and hopefully have good results. So there's a lot of prep work and a lot of work. And the students, very much loved the work. And then I would have them every week tell me how have they integrated these philosophies and these practices into their clerking, into their classes, into their relationships, because you could see the transformation for them. It is not just a subject. It changes the way you look at the world and interact with people. Because at the heart of it, it's about sharing stories and listening in a safe environment where people can tell their, you their truths, their experiences, their feelings in a safe environment. And I always compare it to, and I'll quick do this, I do it with my students. If you go see a physician and you've been stripped and you have that god-awful gown on and the doctor comes racing in looking at his watch and says, how are you doing? It's like, I want out of here. And as opposed to inviting you into his office or her office, sitting across his desk, fully clothed, and, and the doctor saying, tell me about how you're doing. Tell me what's going on in your life. The responses you get is so different from those two. And when you bring that into restorative justice, it changes everything. Um, I'm proud to say that the students that I had going through a number of courses on restorative justice have become, I'm speaking next week at one of my students, um, one student who is being sworn in as a judge in Milwaukee County. She was in the program for two years. I have another one who runs restorative justice programming at the University of Wisconsin um, law school. I've got others that are working in the field. And then I have prosecutors and, and public defenders and private attorneys. And I am confident that they all look at the world differently and practice law differently because they've had those experiences. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shea and I have found, too, that it is a very powerful experience. Uh, we have taught restorative justice now for the second time this fall. And you, a lot of the, the dynamics that you have described are not what we would see right in the paper chase movie, uh, where you know, the, the main uh, thing is to try to create fear or intimidation, but rather these students are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. you know, this was not our experience necessarily in law school, and it's a wonderful thing to create and help form more human, humane uh, lawyers who are, who are empathetic. We are going to have students who will pick up uh, questions that have been written. We'll have some time for questions, but I want to turn while we're doing that to, to Caitlin. A Catholic Mobilizing Network does a lot of uh, educational programming and training. If you could talk a little bit about some of the work that you're doing. Uh, we just uh, were there, uh, Julie Craven and myself in Chicago with you and others. It was uh, very enriching. Uh, and to talk about the importance of, of training, because it's very critical. Uh, both Janine and Mary have talked about the fact that preparation is important uh, and, and training is important. So if you could speak a little bit to the work that Catholic Mobilizing Network is doing. Sure. And so I'd, I'd like to just make sure that I contextualize that with, within uh, the, the range of educational approaches that we're taking. 
uh, Catholic Mobilizing Network grounds its work in education advocacy and prayer. And particularly in our restorative justice work, we recognize that education can take many forms, whether that's literature or speaking at events like these. It, it can also be prayer resources and inviting folks to in, engage that way. Um, and as we've talked about, is deeply experiential. We also acknowledge that interwoven with education is story sharing and network building, which are critical to this, this movement and this work. So, um, sorry, I just wanna, I'm conscientious of our desire to get to questions, and so I'm thinking about how to um, be concise. So at Catholic Mobilizing Network, we seek to offer various opportunities to plug in to this conversation, depending on where you are, what you're looking for, and what you're ready for. Um, I mentioned earlier where some of our, um, our book resources, Redemption and Restoration, A Catholic Perspective on Restorative Justice, was released in 2017 by Liturgical Press in collaboration with Mount St. Mary's, and Justice Keske was one of our authors. I don't have a copy of that with me, but it is an in-depth theological and and practical analysis of restorative justice from a Catholic perspective. Knowing that many folks were looking for something a little bit more bite-sized and introductory, we adapted this larger work into the Harm, Healing, and Human Dignity resource that Father Dan mentioned earlier, and it's been instrumental in inviting folks into the concept. So in terms of experiential opportunities we're trying to create, we have hosted over the course of the last year three what we're calling restorative circles intensive. So these are not trainings, but they're opportunities for Catholics in particular, open to anyone, but kind of geared toward Catholic audiences who have heard about circle process, who are curious about it, but who haven't had the opportunity to experience it themselves, to come together and feel what it's like and discern together where are opportunities, what do I feel called to next. And then as Father Dan mentioned, last week we were, um, we were blessed to convene folks in Chicago with Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation under the very skilled facilitation of Father David Kelly and Sister Janet Ryan to go through a four-day training in peacemaking circle process. And so what we recognize, especially doing this work at a national level, is that it's critical to connect those who are eager to learn with training opportunities that are embedded in communities that already exist. I think sometimes when we're looking to begin something new, um, we, we need to be able to look to our local communities and see what valuable wisdom and experience is already there to draw upon. So while we recognize that there was a particular opportunity to bring Catholics together in Chicago at a Catholic ministry with decades of experience, we are also looking to be bridge builders between those in, in states throughout the country to connect them with the local restorative justice initiatives and training opportunities that are already happening happening in their area. And, you know, in short, in terms of the importance, I think those of us who who are practicing this work recognize that in so many ways this is a simple concept about being in relationship with one another and honoring human dignity and listening deeply and sharing stories. It's simple, but it's so countercultural that we re need to be reminded how to be in that relationship with one another. Um, and so through training, we're able to not only experience this, work through some of our, our own stuff that we bring into the process, and, and also uh, question deeply what are the things that are challenging about doing this work and how do we work through that together and support one another in those processes. Great, thank you, Caitlin. So if you would hold up, if you have a question, please hold them up and students will uh, pick these questions up. While we're picking up questions, uh, a question to each of you for a crisp response. Uh, part of our title today is restorative justice, law, and healing. And you've talked implicitly, and we've all experienced, how restorative justice can be an instrument to healing. But if you could just talk a little bit about how you have seen restorative justice and its practices promote healing and what that means to you. Well, in particular, when you're addressing a, a person, a survivor, or somebody else who's deeply harmed, for them, 
there are two pieces to it, and we've talked about it. One is to be able to safely communicate what that harm has been. Very few people who've been deeply harmed have that opportunity to, to address perhaps the person who caused it or others, to tell them about the deep harm. And there is healing in just telling the story in a safe environment that's a loving environment. The, the counterpiece to that is to hear and get to know the person who's done the harm and to be able to know who they are. And I see that I've not had a victim offender dialogue in a homicide, armed robbery or sexual assault that we've walked out afterwards and the survivor hasn't said, thank God I did this, thank God I did this. And whether it's, whether they travel, what they call a forgiveness journey, or they say, I can't forgive, but I'm much happier, I'm in a better place. It happens every time you do a really well-prepared victim offender dialogue. People, if, if, you, if you, they can express their harm, hear it, have others hear it, acknowledge it, and then hear from the person that caused it and what the perspective is and the remorse they feel, there's great healing in that. And it's very Christian healing um, in the way that Jesus dressed us. So the families that immediately come to mind are the Gromer and McBride's fam McBride families who live in Tallahassee, Florida, and I just had the opportunity to be in circle with them just a few weeks ago. If you're not familiar with their story, Anne Gromer was killed about 10 years ago by her, her fiance, Connor. The families kind of knew each other by association, but they, they weren't close prior to um, when she was killed. Uh, but b both families are religious. The, the Gromers are deeply Catholic and and Deacon Andy was actually in formation in seminary at the time, which is how he heard about restorative justice. And they said to themselves, we, this is what we want. They early on um, felt called and did forgive Connor for, uh, for what he had done and wanted to honor Anne's life in that way. And they wanted the, the criminal justice proceedings that took place as a result to reflect their desires and recognize that as the system was built that did not that was that was not it wasn't structured to happen that way so their story is of course so much so much longer and Kate has written a, a beautiful book on their experience but in short they they advocated tooth and nail to make a restorative process happen and it was the first time let's see if I get this right it was the first time that a restorative justice process was used in a capital case pre-trial in the country. And again, lots of preparation that went into it. Um, and the fact that they, they knew that repair of relationships was critical to, to how they moved forward and were able to see that a process happened that reflected that, the process in itself allowed healing to take place in a way that now these two families travel the country sharing their story and calling for these practices to be used more widely across the country. Mary? I'll do it from a student perspective. I have a student right now who's um, just had the privilege of sitting in a circle process and he said this, it was a tremendous, tremendously inspiring experience and reflected a common takeaway in the restorative justice literature. When you participate in a conference yourself, there's often a kind of conversion moment. I was convinced from that experience that restorative justice could provide a paradigm shifting method of accountability and healing of communities. Thank you. And Professor Shea and I have heard very similar uh, responses, and I'm sure uh, Justice Geske as well. So uh, we have a number of, of uh, good questions. So um, we have 10 minutes left, and, and I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, each of our uh, panelists uh, one of these here. Uh, first of all, to Justice Geske, uh, restorative justice takes a lot of individual uh, attention, time, staff, and volunteer resources. Uh, all things that uh, current justice uh, systems lack. Uh, so what are your thoughts on overcoming this challenge? 
There are a couple of approaches that really help. And our district attorney's office in Milwaukee's had a restorative justice program for 15 years. Um, one is it actually takes less time if, if you use it effectively and helpfully. You can actually shortcut criminal charges or criminal proceedings, particularly on smaller crimes, if you use an, as an alternative a restorative justice approach. And victim satisfa satisfaction with the process goes way up. So one, you can actually cut caseloads and you can just sort of a pragmatic matter. The other piece is really engaging community. Communities we know are harmed by crime, but we let everybody sit back and read the paper at night and go, oh gosh, did he only get five years? That wasn't enough. As opposed to being volunteers and working in these processes as community, you get, you get community involved in the process. Um, you need money in order to have trained facilitators, there, but it's not as expensive as people think. And um, there, most programs are community run um, with one or two trained pr people that help train the others. Okay. Uh, and so to our next question, uh, this was a latecomer, but a good one. Uh, do you, because this is something I was thinking as well, uh, do you find resistance to restorative justice from whom and where? What are the, what are the, uh, the, the kind of dynamics where you, where you find kind of a, a resistance? Caitlin and Mary. Well, I think we've heard about them today already. I mean, Janine had her own resistance um, because she was locked in the old paradigm. And that's how we, it shows up a lot with experienced lawyers and, and law students as well. Um, there's also the secondary trauma piece that if you don't address secondary trauma of your own, you're going to not have the capacity to engage at this level. And so there's a lot of resistance in both. The, we could talk a lot about resistance, but those are the two. And I'll just name another one, and we're doing some studies around this in DC right now, is there's some areas that have started restorative justice and it didn't get the grand impact that they wanted right away and so they pulled back and so th there there's the if you don't change the culture and you don't have trauma informed practices wider than just the circle you set up you set up these restorative justice programs to to not be as successful as they could be and people want immediate responses great thank you caitlin and so I would add, this is a great opportunity for something that I made a note about but didn't have the opportunity to say earlier. But, you know, I, I think that a lot of the pushback comes from the fact that this is a paradigm shift. And it's a paradigm shift that asked us to call into question our traditional understandings of power and who holds mm -hmm. that power. I often say that we do not do restorative justice for others. We do it with and ideally led by those most impacted. This is often in contradiction to many top-down ministerial and institutional cultures, and it's a shift that can be particularly unsettling for those mm. who have traditionally held power. But it invites us into a profound way of being in relationship with one another and one that's rooted not in, in fear and scarcity, but in abundance. And that when we acknowledge our interconnectedness, there is something transformative that has the opportunity to take place. Right. I just want to say, I'll take two sentences. One of the many places it can be used, and we all know the need, is in police community relations. Yes. And you can really get people to understand each other's perspectives and really address some of the, the violence we have on our streets. Thank you. And one of the things that uh, John Choi said last year at, uh, at a conference on justice, and then you know, has been uh, an exemplar in terms of employing this, is getting beyond the baked in paradigms that we see in the criminal justice system and, and elsewhere. And it takes, as Mary says, a, a paradigm shift. One of the things that I've seen in terms of people who kind of reflexively are closed off is they just simply, you know, have not heard enough about it or the stories and haven't experienced it as well. So to Mary, uh, how does secondary trauma experienced by law students who work with traumatized juveniles uh, and, and may manifest PTSD symptoms, uh, even if the students themselves view it as less than what the traumatized juvenile experienced, uh, how does that, how do they deal with that as they start to experience that in their own, uh, in their own response? Uh, how do they deal with it? Uh, we invite them into a multi-step process. 
So the first thing we do is just have them recognize what's actually happening in their bodies. Because trauma, a trauma exposure response shows up in your body. So first recognizing that, and it, it may trigger some of their own trauma in their own background. We have that happening all the time. So, so that's an immediate response that I send them to the clinical psychologist. And we are so grateful at Georgetown Law to have a team of four clinical psychologists just at the law school because we have the largest law school in the country. So they do that preliminary work first, and then the next step, and you can't stop there, the next step is they have to make sense about what they're experiencing. And I, I've got a chapter in an upcoming book that uh, lays this out so I won't bore you with it, but only when, once they make sense of their experience, then they have to, re, they have to integrate the experience that they're having with their identity growing identity as lawyers. Because we think we put on armor and we go in and we're not affected. That's kind of a normal paradigm of the identity stuff. And this is why Neil's work is really important too. So very complicated and good processes, but our law schools are, have been integrating this into our um, practices for quite some time. So it's a multi-step process. Thank you. And while we may have a very lovely atrium here at St. Thomas Law, we do not have four clinical psychologists. <laughs> so to, uh, to Caitlin and to, uh, to Justice Geske, is restorative justice intended to be a, a replacement for or in addition to uh, criminal punishment? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think particularly actually in our anti-death penalty work, I find myself working to clarify this because we acknowledge there are, there are times that incapacitation is necessary for community safety. And so I, I see it as, as something that can, can work in multiple ways, can be an alternative to, can work outside of the system, can work alongside the system, and can work within the system. And that in a comprehensive model, that's, that we need all of it. Um, but that restorative processes can take place even, even when incarceration is needed, but moves us toward a, a way of addressing harm that does not depend on incarceration and punishment solely as our only response. Um, I guess I'll leave it there. The answer is yes, all the above. Um, as I in indicated earlier, you know, on juvenile cases or even smaller offenses, even smaller felony offenses, there are ways you can do diversion with a restorative justice response and where the survivor and everybody is pleased with the outcome. Um, the, 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 the crimes of great violence where there's, there's victim offender dialogues and those are often done. I've done one 40 years after the homicide of, of a man's sister where the offender is still incarcerated. Um, but it's often a length of time. I mean, I usually say a, a, a homicide by intoxicated user three years, often an actual homicide six or seven years or later, and that, which means that they've been sentenced at that point. Um, it plays a role in lots of different ways. Again, it's, very, it's this approach and this, this philosophical approach to whatever the situation is. Um, it can reduce sentences. There are things it can do. But it's, it's a matter of tailoring it for the particular case. Um, another place that we don't have time to talk about that's very controversial is domestic violence. Um, I worked in that field. Um, but I can tell you that many of the practitioners of domestic violence protection the, uh, protecting the women are saying, you know, we generally have about 50% of our cases dismiss out because survivors either return home to the abuser or someone else. Can we use something restorative? Because otherwise we're just pushing, going out the door and say, give us a call next time there's a problem. And I think that's just a new developing field out there. It's also very complicated, but it's something to watch if you're interested in it. Another question for Justice Keske and then a question for, for uh, Professor Novak. Justice Keske, you mentioned that sometimes all victims uh, want is an apology or at least part of what they are looking for. What do we, they, do as attorneys to help perpetrators or those who have uh, been the sources of harm understand the importance of apologies, especially when they're not willing to apologize? Mm -hmm. Well, first, there's nothing worse than a fake apology. 
we hear from politicians all the time, I'm really sorry that you were offended by what I said. You know, I just, you know, or I'm sorry if I upset anybody. That is not an apology, right? I'm, I'm sorry you reacted the way you reacted. Um, and, and, and we hear it all the time, right? So um, don't follow that model. People that have been charged with crimes or have been in prison often will write an apology or even even state one at sentencing, and there's usually a lot of I, the letter I in the whole sentence. It's all about, you know, I've suffered, my family has suffered. You know, guess what? The person that was assaulted or was shot doesn't want to hear the tough life you've lived at that moment. They may want to hear it later, but they don't. So as lawyers, I think trying to get, a, and I, that's one of the things I do in the prep work, is get the, the refocus on the harm that happened to the person and not what they've gone through. We may get to that, but so I think, you know, I, and times I watch sentencing and I think that defense lawyer didn't spend any time preparing a particular person to speak and, and I can tell you that victims become enraged yes. because of a sentencing that carries on for 20 years because they never have any other contact. So in terms of writing letters or stating apologies, and if somebody doesn't want to apologize, then they shouldn't. And I, I am dead against judges ordering apology letters. I think it's a horrible idea. If somebody is not acknowledging they've caused harm, they shouldn't do it. So, um, but there's a lot a lawyer can do to try to have the defendant in the victim or victim's family's shoes to understand and to acknowledge the harm. And just like the doctor, the story I told you, she never said I was at fault. She's just acknowledged the harm that had happened to the family with a baby that had died, and that in that case was enough. So there are ways you can kind of do it, but um, and you can't have an offender call, I'm sorry about what happened to the victim. The victim has a name, and you better use that name and acknowledge that humanity. So those are my brief suggestions. Thank you. And a final question to, uh, to Professor Novak. Uh, real briefly, I was up in, um, North Dakota at Standing Rock. My classmate from seminary is a pastor there. And he talked already in their Montessori school, they are training with, they call it a peace rose. And, and one of the things in terms of restorative justice is that it really uh, is located first in the indigenous peoples of North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, this is the question from the audience. How might a restorative justice philosophy consciousness affect school discipline practice? And we just have a very brief few seconds. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. In short, a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah, and again. The three-tiered system, so community building, uh, di um, discipline, as well as reentry. Great. Yeah. And very briefly, in terms of summary, this is part, part the law professor and me. Uh, philosoph restorative justice is a philosophical approach to harm. It requires a paradigm shift. Uh, it often uses circles. Uh, where people will pass a, a, a talking piece and only that person has the time uh, to express the harm, either primary or secondary harm that they might have experienced. It's really victim-survivor-centered uh, and may have a perpetrator, but always only if the victim-survivor would want that person, if it would be helpful for them. Forgiveness is not uh, necessarily the goal because that is adding another burden onto a victim survivor. So that's an important distinction as well. Uh, and so thank you very much to our panelists. They did a, a wonderful job in our opening primer on restorative justice. We're going to take 10 minutes, a uh, 10 minute break, and we'll be back for the second panel. And why don't we show our, our first panel our gratitude? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great job, everybody. All right, let's Hello. get started. This is the, uh, the panel that will talk about using restorative justice to heal participants and overcome injustice. We have Artika Tyner, Dr. Tyner in the middle here. She's the founding director of our law school's Center on Race, Leadership, and Social Justice. Uh, as her bio says, I, I, I love this part of what, what she views to be her, her mission. She's committed to training students to serve as social engineers who create new inroads to justice and freedom. Uh, Artika was one of the first people that introduced me to restorative justice more than five years ago. 
I had her come into the uh, crime and punishment course and talk about her experience with uh, restorative justice and racial justice issues. And now uh, the course is entitled Crime, Punishment, and Restorative Justice, uh, in part thanks to her. Seated uh, at the end of the table is Annalise uh, Annie Booth. She's a fellow in dispute resolution at the Center on Mediation and Negotiation at Northwestern School of Law. She will address how restorative justice has changed her thinking, the way she sees and understands the legal system. She also is a practitioner in uh, Chicago with community-based organizations that are engaged in restorative justice. And one of those organizations that she works with, uh, Monica Cosby, to my immediate uh, right, your left, uh, is an advocate for. Uh, Monica has a very deep personal journey regarding restorative justice that we'll hear about today. Um, again, I love the description in the bio. Uh, she's a mother, a grandmother, an activist, an organizer, a restorative justice and peace circle keeper, a poet, and, and much more. Monica will highlight the need for reparation and healing for systemic harms. And she will emphasize the importance of understanding issues such as race, poverty, gender, trauma, and mental illness in the context of restorative justice. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Tyner and uh, give each of them a, a, a time frame to, to give their initial views and then we'll take your questions. Thank you. I feel like my life went full circle this morning because about a decade ago we were gathered here with our civil rights clinic, the Community Justice Project, to talk about restorative justice in schools. So I'm happy to hear, just based upon the introduction from Professor Shea and a special thank you to Father Griffith for bringing us together to talk about restorative justice more than just a scholarly endeavor. But for me, restorative justice and what it means, that's what I'll start with, restorative justice for me is really a way of life. Restorative justice is rooted in my culture and my faith. So I'll start with culture, because oftentimes we think of restorative justice as a scholarly pursuit and a symposium like what we're gathered here today, but I heard in the first panel um, some of the information about the roots of restorative ju justice in indigenous cultures and communal societies. For, so for me, that takes me back home to Mama Africa, the idea that in Liberia, when you have a conflict, that you'll go to the Plava Hut and you'll use a talking piece. The elders will come together and help to solve conflicts. I also had the opportunity to participate in the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which for me, it was also life-changing because it included the diaspora. So Hamlin University served as the host. And then I had the opportunity to travel with one of my mentors, Professor Levy Armstrong, to South Africa. And we traveled to South Africa and we learned about this concept called Ubuntu. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu talks about it as a gift from Africa, that a person is a person through others. It talks about our shared humanity and our common destiny. And I thought this sounds great, but how does it play out in real life? And so as I remained in South Africa, and I've since returned on multiple occasions, I started to question, how do you infuse this in our day-to-day -day life? One quick example is a high court in South Africa. The High Court in South Africa is actually built from what? It's built from some of the bricks of the prisons where anti-apartheid leaders were held, like Nelson Mandela. So when I say way of life, we have to be intentional on how we interact with each other, how we engage in systems change, and how we radically transform the way we think and interact with each other. When I also talk about a way of life and rooted in my faith, I woke up this morning and was like, don't miss this, Micah 6.8, seek justice, love mercy and walk humbly before God. Restorative justice helps to move us in that direction. And then I had to show off a little bit and enter faith. I went to Hebrew school as I was growing up and I said, oh, and it also sounds like tikkun alone, that we have a responsibility as lawyers, as the community to help repair and heal the world. So when I think about restorative justice, it's more than just a conversation. It's a way of life, it's a way of being, and it's a philosophy in essence on how we could be stronger together than we are apart. The other piece about restorative justice to set my context around the school to prison pipeline and some of the racial justice issues that I worked on, it's rooted in what was my first experience? How did I get involved? My first experience was related to earning a certificate in conflict studies at Hamlin. And don't worry, I'm a Tommy times three, so I'm not doing a Hamlin commercial. But uh, I earned my undergraduate degree at Hamlin. And one of the opportunities that we had there was our internship 
And this is a girl who never left Rondo. Just one mile radius was my whole life. And they said, would you like to go to London and do an internship at the Greenwich Mediation Center? I'm like, I think I've been on a plane once, maybe no thanks. But I was convinced by my professors of another thing, that if I was going to be committed to restorative justice, I had to be a global citizen. So I packed my bags as my parents cried, but I made that long journey to London. And in London at the Greenwich Mediation Center, one aspect that I worked on was restorative justice in schools. And at that point, I was training to become a high school English teacher, so I was a student teacher, so I was amazed. We would go into the schools and they'd start their day with a talking circle. And I thought, what does this have to do with our standardized tests and getting our work done? But lo and behold, it had everything to do with it. Because what had happened in the schools in Greenwich is that they had radically transformed the culture. Students didn't have to wait to talk about maybe some of the dilemmas that they experienced in the community or even at home. They didn't have to wait to tell their teachers what was impacting them that day, whether it was good or bad or in between. That through the talking circle, they had an opportunity to share about their lives and build connections. And I thought, oh, that looks a little magical. But I wanted to know, how did it really work around school disciplinary issues? What were they really doing? So they were using circles, family group conferencing, bringing the community in to also deal with school disciplinary issues. And what was magical to me, once again, it looked quite different than what I was starting to see in the schools in the US. In the US, I started to see school resource officers in the schools. I was just reading a report this morning. 14 million students have a school resource officer in their school, but yet they don't have social workers, psychologists, educational support, and even what we know in the past as school counselors. So the landscape started to change. And I know one of the questions was related to how do you do this? It feels expensive, it feels difficult. We must do this out of necessity. So part of the work was primarily volunteer driven. Parents and community members came into that school to support the students. So all of a sudden, students went from addressing and dealing with conflict and disciplinary issues to becoming those change agents themselves. What did they gain from it? As an educator, I'd love to use some of the terminology, those pro-social behaviors, skill sets, leadership development, positive behavioral intervention services, all those pieces really sum up as restorative justice. So fast forward of why Professor Shea brought me here today. I came back home and started my work as a civil rights attorney because I believe that the law is a language of power. I grew up during the war on drugs and mass incarceration, so I felt in my community we were powerless. And I knew if I could get a law degree and earn it, I could really be that gladiator for justice. And a sidebar, that's from Howard Zayer. I called him one day and he actually answered the phone. I was quite impressed. He said, maybe lawyers could get it right if we looked at it a little differently, if we focused on healing and being gladiators for justice. And I said, I like that. I always wanted to be a superhero, sign me up. And so lo and behold, I was faced with a real dilemma. I started to get a number of phone calls and I was watching the news. This was in the early 2000s. I saw a five-year-old African-American girl who was handcuffed, arrested and taken in the back of a police car and they struggled with her. It looked horrific on the news because they couldn't get the handcuffs on her hands. And what was her crime? A temper tantrum. Well, what did it look like after everything escalated? Assault, obstructing a legal process. She probably had five charges and she was only five years old. And then I thought, hmm, you know, I asked that Marvin Gaye question of what's going on. And I didn't have to look too far because I was one morning reading the news and I saw the story of a woman by the name of Tunette Powell. Tunette Powell said, well, my kids are four and six. They've been suspended from preschool eight times in one year. Once again, I reached out, didn't have to use the phone then, I sent an email. I said, Tunette, tell me more. What's happening? And that was the onset of the conversation about the preschool to prison pipeline. But then when I started to talk to my friends and colleagues, many were indifferent. So he said, you're, you're just talking about black people. I'm like, well, I am black. I hope I'm talking about <laughs> And I'm a citizen of the world. Remember, I said that. So what impacts one impacts all. So we're interrelated. So let's figure this thing out. And then I was met with so many excuses. They said, well, Artika, don't you understand? Black people commit more crimes. Like, show me. Don't you understand? I was looking at this data last night. 
the essence of black on black crime. It was like, do you understand the essence on white on white crime, Hispanic on Hispanic crime, Asian on Asian crime? Crime is by proximity. And if you don't believe me, look at the data from the Department of Justice. And in fact, black on black crime of whatever it's supposed to be is in fact lower than white on white crime, but we never talk about these things. So my friend said, you don't understand. These black kids you're talking about are those super predators that the politicians were referring to. You don't understand. I even saw one news report that said we are born with a hoodlum gene. We are more prone to being in gangs and using drugs. And so I started to grow weary of this, and then I had a beacon of hope. Arnie Duncan was appointed as the uh, commissioner of the Department of Education at the national level, so Secretary Duncan. He started to look at some of these things and raise some of the questions that I was raising. He started to ask why were children of color, African-American children in particular, let's go back to that preschool to prison pipeline, three times more likely to be referred out of the classroom. If we go to the K through 12 piece, four times more likely to be referred out of the classroom. He started to go through the data. I was like, he feels like a real Tommy. I had to go back and look at his bio. Did he learn how to think critically? act wisely, work skillfully, all for the common good. I was like, we might have to recruit him. So I took his methodology into our civil rights clinic, into the community justice project. And guess what we did? We started asking some questions. You know, those were the late nights when I put my bifocals on and started looking at the data. Right in St. Paul, I'll raise it as a question for the audience. What do you think were the main areas as far as legal issues in which African-American students and students of color were referred into the juvenile justice system. What were some of the issues you think arose? Anyone? Anything? Truancy? Thank you. My friends denied it. My colleagues denied it. One of the greatest pipelines into the juvenile justice system is around truancy. And what does it mean when we start looking at truancy? It means you might have instability in housing, and other aspects of your life, but do we criminalize that? Things that make you go, hmm, I'll help out the audience. The other issues were in subjective categories, like insubordination, uh, maybe it was related to misconduct, and I thought to myself, I would have been referred to the juvenile justice system early and often, because if you think I can talk now, imagine what I was like at six or seven years old. <laughs> I didn't take a breath. But there was an amazing teacher who teaches here at St. Thomas in our School of Education, Dr. Graves. He found me when I was in middle school and turned my life around. He said, oh, you love to talk? Huh, you seem to have a little bit of knowledge. Why don't you tutor everyone else? So that was my first time of being an educator and a tutorer. And fast forward to today, that's why I'm an educator right now. But imagine if instead if he said, oh, Really, her actions is insubordination. We better get that school resource officer. Imagine if he said, well, and I did have one act of truancy. I'm looking at Father Griffith. I will tell the truth. Here's my morning confession. I had finished my advanced placement, my IB exams, and I had convinced my art teacher that I needed a little lunch break. So if you know anything about my high school, Highland Park, which is right in our backyard here, um, right down on the same bus line is a McDonald's and I love chicken nuggets with sweet and sour sauce. This is for my students in case you want to impress me. And so lo and behold, I took the bus and officer not so friendly as soon as I got on the bus was there. <laughs> and I said, well, Miss Ray said, <laughs> and literally I'm the gifted and talented student here. It didn't matter, but I was like, Miss Ray said we could go get chicken nuggets. There was two of us. Officer not so friendly took me into custody. Now, if we look at it today, if we fast forward, if that played out, my parents just picked me up and that was the end of it. Today, that would, would have been a referral directly into the juvenile justice system and a gateway into what I like to call the tangled web of mass incarceration. In America, we have about 5% of the world's population and nearly a quarter of the world's prison population. And we know that a referral at the level of K through 12 and even at that preschool level then drastically increases the likelihood of future incarceration. So there are things that we should be doing. So fast forward to this idea then of seeing all these challenges. The question then became for my students and I, what could we do and how could we bring forth meaningful change? It took me full circle to where I began. Restored with justice is a way of life, not just a scholarly endeavor. 
So all of a sudden, I asked my students, I said, how can we bring restorative justice to this issue called the school to prison pipeline? So we started with, it was actually a great opportunity because at the national level, we were asking so many questions about the criminal justice system. We were asking questions of how could we spend $80 billion on incarceration, on placing people on parole and probation. It's cost prohibitive. I was looking in the state of Minnesota, it costs about $41,000 to incarcerate someone. I said, that sounds like a good St. Thomas education, less room and board. So I would love to have that investment in our community when I think about, and I say it in a joking manner, but I say it in all seriousness. We also have to ask ourselves, where are we investing our resources? When I started working locally on the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative, we found that it cost about $60 a day to place a young person in a community-based alternative to detention, meaning something basic. In my community, it's returning back to the village, being surrounded by caring adults, being surrounded by the support in, that you need to be able to learn grow, and if we want to look at it in restorative justice terms, be a good citizen, get involved, build stronger communities. So we started incorporating some of the themes around restorative justice into JDAI. We started looking at our school disciplinary practices. We drew upon Denver public schools that replaced words like suspension and expulsion with circles, with compassion, with empathy. We started to look at the work of Angela Davis's sister, Fanya Davis in Oakland, and we wanted to know what was working there. How was it that she was able to ensure that young people were obtaining their education, bringing, drastically bringing down the infractions around school disciplinary issues and the juvenile justice system? We wanted to know. So we started to do research. We started to look at best practices and we started to change policies. So if I conclude my thoughts on this, of what restorative justice means to me and what it can do as a potential possibilities, it can offer us an alternative. And it can offer us an alternative with some residual benefits. I started to look at one of the mechanisms called youth courts. One of my mentors, Dr. Agar Khan, had introduced me to his work in Washington, D.C. Some of the data show that an African-American male had, males had 80% chance of going to prison in their lifetime. I don't know about you, I think sometimes we just almost get immune to some of the data. We can just say it in our sleep. A black boy born in early 2000 has a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. A Hispanic boy, one in six. We quote it like it's fun. But if we believe in restorative justice, that's our son and brother. So we have to ask some critical questions. So youth court, youth court offers the opportunity as a diversion, if there is an infraction with a juvenile, to be able to then be a part of a process led by the community, led by youth to help resolve some of these issues. Some folks asked about costs. Youth court typically costs ten dollars to $20,000. But look at the residual impact again. Young people, there was one study in 2008 that showed with their investment of about one million hours of service in the community. It was able to bring a residual benefit of over $11 million of investment of time and resources in the community. So what I can tell you about restorative justice, it works, but it will require of us a change in our paradigm, a change in the way that we look at things, and to be able to say, especially related to the school to prison pipeline, I am my brother and sister's keeper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tyner. And again, a reminder, if you have questions, please fill them out, hold them up, and students will collect them. We'll now turn to Annie Booth. Thank you for that, Dr. Tyner. And I hope that as we speak up here today, we can keep in mind and at the forefront uh, sons and brothers and friends and people we care about and love. Um, I'd like to start with a quote um, from an Aboriginal activist group from Queensland, Australia in the 1970s. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I teach uh, restorative justice at Northwestern Law School and I also focus on our restorative justice initiatives there. And I have the opportunity to learn with and from students. I have the opportunity to unlearn 
uh, with them as well. And an important part of that work is connecting the Northwestern Law community uh, with other communities as well. Um, and that's how I've been able to build a relationship with Monica Cosby, who you will hear from today. And that is an essential part um, of wrestling with how do we address injustice? How do we address inequity? Um, and that really does require a shift in paradigm, as Dean Vischer talked about this morning. Um, expanding our narrow focus of the law and inviting others to be a part of those conversations and to work uh, with us in advocating for justice. So in my role, I get a lot of questions about, you know, what is restorative justice? And it's interesting because in some of the conversations I've had about restorative justice in different neighborhoods and areas, get some pushback. Um, so there are some people who really don't like the word restorative. Why would we restore something that didn't exist in the first place? Why would we restore an unjust status quo? The way that we see it um, is that restorative is about healing, and it's the idea of restoring an ideal of human dignity and respect that all people uh, deserve. And it's interesting because people have just as much of an issue with the word justice. And in fact, you'll find some people who don't want to talk about restorative justice and they'll only use restorative practices. And one thing that I found is there are some people who want nothing to do with the criminal justice system. It has so tainted the word justice that they don't want any affiliation. Um, and as an attorney, that's something that's really troubling, that's sad. And my hope is that we can begin to reclaim the word justice. So restorative justice is about being in right relationship. It's right relationship with yourself, with others, with the natural world, and seeing the interconnection and interdependence of those relationships. And so, yes, it does focus on repairing harm when there's a breakdown or a violation of those relationships. Um, and as attorneys, that's something I think that's easier for us to understand as far as crime being a breakdown in those relationships and crime resulting in harm. Um, but something that I wanted to share about, and that's become increasingly important to me on my restorative justice journey, is the idea that I need restorative justice. I need restorative justice as an attorney, and it's not about restorative justice being for those people or for my client, um, but that it's important for me also to think about what that means as a whole person, um, because I'm more than just an attorney, um, and I think there is danger when we fall into that narrative of what an attorney is, um, and having such a limited perspective. And so what does that mean that I need restorative justice? Um, part of that is doing the work to recognize kind of what's happened with me and my own identity and understanding my history and ancestors and how that um, informs the way I engage with the world, how I engage with others. But it also means holding up the mirror and practicing introspection as an attorney. And this is where I think it is essential that we spend time thinking about how to repair the collective, the systemic, historic harms um, of our carceral systems. And it's not only the criminal legal system, but there are a number of systems, our education, healthcare, immigration, welfare systems, that work in conjunction together to regulate and punish certain individuals and communities. And we are living our history. And that means that we have to focus on repairing harm for slavery, for the genocide and forced removal of indigenous people. And something that I have thought a lot about is as an attorney and kind of my role how have I 
maintained, strengthened, perpetuated um, unjust systems. And I think back to when I first started as a legal aid attorney. And part of my work um, involved representing clients who were being evicted from public housing. And the law, not just. And that meant that if someone's son or grandson um, had committed a crime, that they might be evicted because of that. And I remember um, advising clients and letting them know, you know, here's what it looks like if we go to trial. Um, but then counseling them about settlement. If you bar your son or grandson um, from your housing and don't allow them to come there, um, then you'll be able to stay. And I had to step back and realize in many ways I am part of this system and I am contributing to the breakdown of black and brown families. And that was something really difficult. So yes, I absolutely believe that people need representation. Yes, I believe we need progressive prosecutors and compassionate public defenders. But we also need to step back and really wrestle with kind of our role and changes as far as systems and structures because it goes beyond individuals. So I asked myself, are we, am I failing to challenge um, structures and systems? Am I not pushing hard enough for change and just accepting status quo? Am I failing to share power? Am I failing of dreaming of something different outside the bounds of what I have learned about um, in the legal system? And one of my students reminded me, you don't know what you don't know. And so even with good intentions, we don't always know our impact. And something that has helped me with kind of insight into that impact is relationship and community. And that really is the essence of restorative justice. It is, um, as Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative says, it's getting proximate. And so are we kind of stepping back and taking the time as attorneys to build relationships and be in community with others who we may not otherwise be in community with? Um, and I've learned a lot from that um, and seen how much I have to both learn and unlearn. And um, to just share a little bit, um, so there's a restorative justice hub system in Chicago and different um, groups that have kind of foundational values um, based on restorative justice and I was at one of their events and it was a group called Circles and Ciphers and they use restorative justice, hip hop um, in order to uh, serve and work with young people who've been impacted by violence and they're youth-led and I met uh, somebody named Vanessa and asked her about her work and after that we connected and um, spent time getting to know each other and she was really interested in um, creating a women of color circle space and through that relationship um, what I was able to see is what does it mean for healing in terms of violence um, outside of what we think of in the context of the legal system. So what does it mean beyond just an individual? How do we heal in community together? How do we actually share with each other in circle and live out these restorative justice values? Um, and it's not just clients or participants, but me as an attorney as well. What does that mean um, as far as respect, compassion, my own vulnerability, openness? And one thing that I took away from that relationship is her willingness to tell me and others, I love you. 
And that was something so hard, and it's not something I bring to my legal work, this idea of love, or it hadn't been, that is changing, that's shift in paradigm and broadening. Um, but I realized that is something that might have been a personal value. But we don't talk about love at the law school, um, typically. I don't want to speak for all law schools. But it's not something that you hear in courtrooms either, love. And so that was really powerful to me as far as being in relationship, starting to see and recognizing harms of the system and acknowledging those, and then focusing on what actions does that require of us? Can we dream of something more together when we are in uh, community? And when we begin to deeply hear and see each other, and that means we actually have to talk with each other. And sometimes that means we have to work to move beyond barriers as well, because we come from different backgrounds. Um, and that's sometimes acknowledging privilege and harm um, where we might have benefited from that. And so we have to work through some of those barriers to be together. Um, but when we do that, then we can begin to change and transform that narrative. And that's when we can become more than what we've done and more than what's happened to us. Thank you, Annie. So we'll now turn to Monica Cosby and, and maybe just to plant the seed, I'd like you all to be able to reflect on each other's comments before we start taking questions. But Monica? Oh, um, first, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I just have to say this to everybody. I'm, I do this fairly often and I'm always nervous anytime before I speak today. I, like really nervous and intimidated, but here I am anyway. Um, thanks. One of the, can y'all hear me okay? Is this better? Okay. I love this quote that you started off with, Annie, thank you. So I, I've heard this before and I have expressed the same sentiment um, of the things that drive the work that I do. Much of my life is informed by the 20 years that I spent in prison and the life that I lived before then. Um, December will be four years that I have been out of prison. And I became engaged in the work actually while I was in prison and in some ways beforehand. Um, in response to your quote and the thing that drives me, part of what drives me to do the work that I can sum up is Audre Lorde's, I am not free while any woman is unfree even if her shackles are very different than my own. Right, And so it is this thing of if we are well and truly going to be free and in community with each other, you don't get to save us because you're really not free either, right? It's this idea of our liberation being bound up with each other to be in community with each other, right? And I think there are some spaces where this gets missed. Um, so I had never heard really of restorative justice as a term until I got out of prison. I think I heard the term once while I was in prison, um, but I had never really heard it as a term until I got out. Um, but what we did do in prison is we practice restorative justice in prison and communities everywhere, and we've been doing this for a long time. I'm born and raised in Chicago, right? So I'm from Uptown and Englewood, so if I wasn't on the south side of Chicago, I was on the north side of Chicago. And say something went haywire in the neighborhood, right? And we have a young person that maybe clowned a little bit and you know did some stuff. The response oftentimes when I was growing up was not I'm gonna call the cops because we always know that it's not helpful, right? Where I come from, officer friendly is a myth. Like we just, it's not a thing. So we tend to handle these things in community. Okay, so you're taking the garbage out for a week or are you gonna do this, but we find a way to repair that harm that does not involve the criminal legal system. I am also in the camp that feels like, as a term, restorative justice, I've often asked this question, I've posed it to Annie and other people, how do you restore something we never really had for a lot of us here, right? And so I have, um, I take some exception to the term, like I think it's fantastic what we do, but I think we have to really meet, think about what that means to restore justice, especially to whom people, for whom people haven't traditionally had it. People who have been 
marginalized and criminalized for like since the 1600s here, right? Um, so we really have to take these things to account. And we also have to stop saying, I'm going to restore justice for you. So you're not giving us something, right? It's something that should have been here the whole entire time and it hasn't been. So we have to acknowledge that. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the work that I do. I'm a community organizer at Westside Justice Center, which is right on the west side of Chicago, right? So we're a legal aid clinic and we're in the community of the people that we say that we work for because by and large, we are the people who we do this work for, right? Um, I'm also lead organizer of the Women's Justice Institute and I'm director of organizing at Moms United Against Violence and Incarceration. And a lot of our work intersects like in very different spaces, but it still intersects. And so most of the work that we do is um, fighting criminalization, whether it's trying to keep someone from going to prison, to keep someone in their housing, to whatever it is. When we talk about the reparation of harm, we have to talk about really what that is. A lot of the focus is always on something that we tend not to do in Chicago, and I especially don't. I don't use the victim offender language. Um, we just, we don't, and we don't have time to get into that, but I'll probably talk about that later. Um, there is, the person who committed harm and the person who's been harmed, right? Um, and we have to really and truly give people the chance to repair harm, and we don't, or we put conditions on it, right? This is not something we can do. So I remember when I was in, I don't talk about my case much. So when I was finishing up with, in, at trial, okay, when I was finishing up at trial, I said I was sorry. I am. Right? But we don't always look at the whole entire thing. We look at the thing that happened, but we don't look at everything in its context. So I'm coming from, so this, these are things we know. You talked about ACEs earlier, the ACEs studies, right? So we know that most people in prison were victims of some pretty horrific stuff long before ever being a defendant in a criminal legal case. We know this. We know this for, ju for juveniles, we know this for young people, and we know this for adults. But we continue to ignore these things. We continue to ignore these things. So if we want to restore justice, part of that is building a world where these harms don't happen, right? And building a world so that when they do, we are better equipped to deal with them. But part of this is, re is building a world where this doesn't happen. That means building a world that's not full of adverse childhood experiences. So what I'm talking about specifically, poverty. It's manufactured, it isn't real, it doesn't even have to be, right? Housing, stable housing that's non-coercive, that's not predicated on staying in a violent relationship so we have somewhere to live, right? All these things, gender violence, gender-based violence, poverty, race, the criminal legal system, all, and so many more things intersect. Like I can give you a perfect example right now. In Illinois, particularly in Chicago, a DCFS case almost always triggers a criminal legal case. It's usually for moms, particularly poor moms, poor black and brown moms in particular, and poor rural white moms in central and southern Illinois, right? And largely it's about poverty. So there are right now in Illinois 22 different reasons where the state can terminate your parental rights. You only have to meet one of those criteria. Most people fit a whole lot of them. And most of those things are based on material needs. Housing, do you have one, one individual bed for each child? All these different things. And so if DCS, DCFS comes in and says, you have to do this, 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 and this, nobody's helping people get those things done, but then we're taking children away, right? Um, so what are we saying about the way that we value communities and motherhood and people, period, from spaces like this, right? The onset of a criminal legal case can almost, you're almost guaranteed if you're a mom that there's going to be some DCFS cases with that, right? And there, there are some organizations that are helping to try to alleviate this, but this is so big, there just aren't enough people that are trying to do this work of restoration and reunification. We don't think about these things in this way. Um, there are, we talk about 
like, so there are things that we know, we talk about trauma all the time and the way trauma changes the brain. We know this. One traumatic incident in a fully grown, fairly stable, well-adjusted, well-socialized adult changes the brain. So what do you think the constant trauma of, so I grew up in a family and I'm just like a whole lot of other people that, that are in the prison now. I come from a place of violence for most of my life. Physical violence, sexual violence, domestic violence, poverty, um, all these different things. When I went to prison, it was in many ways an extension of the life that I'd already lived, right? And then coming back has been, I've got to do some really cool stuff, but I've also had a really, really hard time out here, right? In a lot of ways, I'm still struggling but I'm also still here doing those things that I believe in. But I'm able to do that because I'm in community with people, right? And that's what, I think this is one of the things that we really have to understand. Like we are interconnected, whether you want to be or not, right? We are, and your liberation is bound up with mine. Mine is bound up with yours. So I have to be here. Um, I thought for a hot second this morning, like, I'm just like oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm probably just gonna stay outside and smoke a cigarette and I'll let them do the panel without me. And, you know, but I am in community, right? And this is the way that I choose to do the things that I know how to do, that I hope are really truly changing policy and really truly helping people on the ground every day. And I think a lot of things get missed in the theoretical discussions about policy and this and that because people are trying to survive right now today. And there are things that we can do right now today that would make an immediate difference. And since if we know what those things are and we don't do them, this is also kind of a crime, right? So there are things that are against the law and then there are things that are actual crimes, right? Um, which is decided, did you say this was decided by, by different legislatures, right? So we can, there are things that we can do right now because it's, Everything doesn't have to be a response to after something has happened. We can do the things that we can do right now that we know that can build a world where largely these things won't. And I just, I hope that we can work together to do those things. Thank you, Monica, for sharing that. It's, it's a story we all can benefit from hearing. Um, let's talk about, first of all, reactions, and then maybe some of the things that Monica was finishing with. If you were, if you were in charge, I often like to ask my students, if you were the legislature and the governor of your state, what changes would you make a priority to change the entire system for better? Artika, you want to go first? Since my focus was, was initially on schools, I would think about um, restoring some of the social services that we had when I was growing up. You could go to a school counselor related to career development. You had social services if there was an issue related to housing or students coming to school hungry. By the time I was a student teacher, I was amazed because you had no place to go if you were hungry. Three out of five students are showing up each day to school hungry, and we're not even solving that issue. And then we'll prosecute them for stealing food. I'm like, some of these things are kind of riddled up. And then one day I was waiting in my, um, I was under supervision, it was for my student teaching, so I was waiting, I was like, why is there this extra bus? There was a whole busload of students going to a homeless shelter at the end of the school day. So if we're thinking about this, schools can't solve it alone, and if we go to what both of my uh, co-panelists talked about, taking a holistic approach around community, I think it also has to be at the grassroots level. So if I think of two restorative justice initiatives that really inspired me, one is the Circles of Peace led by Russell Ballinger. Those are community members coming together every Monday. And remember I said it's a way of life, it's about culture, it's about faith at Unity Unitarian Church. And they're grappling with complex issues, community police relations, related to homicide, related to racial tensions. They were the group that gathered when uh, the church had a banner up that said Black Lives Matter and the, the banner was destroyed. Those are everyday people, law enforcement, community members coming together saying, how do we build the strength of our community and how do we make sure that we build the type of relationship that makes it something that we're teaching our young people, the next generation, but we talk about sustainability in the future 
How do we create a better world? That's also in our social fabric. The next one is from Death to Life that was created by Mary Johnson, who lost her only son to violence. Now, she could have taken the idea of just living her life in, in anger, pain, and despair. And she did something that I still can't oftentimes wrap my mind around. I'm like, Miss Mary, say this one more time. But she requested through the Department of Corrections an opportunity to uh, meet with the offender who took her only child's life. And I was like, okay. And then what happened next, Miss Mary? We go through this over the, the years. We've gone through this time and time again. At first, he didn't meet with her. But eventually, he decided to. And she talked about how faith... Faith compelled her to forgive him. And in forgiving him, I was like, that's nice. Okay, I can handle that. I forgive you, run out the room. But she took an extra step. When he came back home, in front of the public, the world, BBC News, everyone looked at this. She said that he was her son and basically adopted him as an adult. They've traveled the world to talk about how to end violence, how to build a stronger sense of community. They're neighbors. They live in the same apartment building. I mean, so she's really taken this on in a sense of saying, his future is wrapped into my future and we're all connected together. And Ms. Monica made me pause about going into a maximum security prison and doing some restorative justice work. This idea of offender and victim, I'm not sure if they're clear delineations. Sometimes they're very fluid. Each of those men, there's two things that stood out to me. First of all, they learned how to read in prison. So people oftentimes think, they're like, don't you sleep, Dr. Tyner? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Because my community, we, there's work that we need to do. So I started writing children's books, not just for fun. I started to write them when I realized that one in four of America's children don't know how to read. Uh-oh, we got a challenge there. They're not literate. And if I'm not literate by fourth grade, I'm four times more likely to do what? Drop out of school. Third grade reading scores, what do we know about them? According to some of the sociologists, you can project the prison beds 10 years out. 85% of the kids in the juvenile justice system today can't read. So all of a sudden, I got grow weary of my clients saying, I learned how to read in prison. That's why I started publishing children's books. Why am I bringing this up? We're going to need some unconventional solutions to address a myriad of issues, and we can't be lost in this is the victim, this is the offender, this person did this, this person did that. Ms. Monica, you covered it well. It's about how we build a sense of community. And the last piece, I know I was running out of time with my remarks. I'm watching my time. The last piece was related to this idea on how you can engage in restorative justice. You cannot do restorative justice or even, it shouldn't even come out of your mouth until you grapple with yourself. The things that I was telling you in my remarks were really about me. When I said friends and colleagues, I was really talking about myself. I thought my own people from being indoctrinated by white supremacy, I, I feared my own people. I'll tell you, when I went to Chicago, most of my family's from Chicago, just keep me in the house because I was fearful of gun violence from what I saw in the news. So now I had to go back. I couldn't do restorative justice and still I, until I started to challenge myself. And when I started to unpack myself, I'm a professor, so I had to bring a little homework. I started reading books like this, Bias, because I had to start asking, when I'm going into the courtroom, what do I see? I say I see the scales of justice and I'm being fair. No, I did not. And here's a free homework assignment. Go to the Harvard Implicit Association test and start to unpack and work through some of your biases. And then I had to realize this piece about race, a book by uh, Dr. Mahmoud El Khati, The Myth of Race and the Reality of Racism. I realized, although I was like, I'm blind too, just like Mama Justice. I wasn't blind. I went in the courtroom, and, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but I think you opened up this kind of piece on how, do we, how can we be transparent. I mean, I was in landlord-tenant law and, and working on cases. I'm a landlord myself, and I was blaming people for being poor. I never thought about collateral consequences. I'm like, hey, that's your fault. If the grandson, if the son committed a felony, they can't be there. But I didn't realize that collateral consequences were like that scarlet letter, that F for felon that never went away. Ever. Ever. Both on administrative law side for my administrative law students and also by precedent and by case law, it's everywhere. So I had to step back and say, I cannot say restorative justice until I unpack me. I have to unpack when I see my clients. I'm like, isn't that a shame? I remember I was in family law working on a child support case. It was an older uh, man of color, and, he, and I, I never called anyone by name because then it meant I had to get personal with him. So I was like, uh, yes, Mr. Defendant. <laughs> and he's like, um, I have a name. I was like, oh, sorry, sir. <laughs> and then I went from there, and he's like, you just calculated my whole life, and you never looked up at me. 
So as lawyers, I think if we're going to talk about restorative justice, not just about a case, it has to be about a mentality. And I remember doing my internship with Judge Zimmerman, and one of the things that he said, you transformed me. I'm like, how, Judge? I was scared of you, and I barely could write these orders. You should have fired me. But he said, you were the first person that challenged me to call everyone by name. I had a chance to work with the late Judge Larry Cohen and Tom Johnson with my Council on Crime and Justice externship. Same thing stood out again. Yes, we could study these collateral consequences and these issues all day long. I spent a whole semester looking at assault in the third degree. And I'm like, if you're convicted of that, I can't drive a school bus, can't, ride, can't uh, run for school board, and I can't handle potatoes. I'm like, what does that have to do with assault? But I say all these things because, once again, we have to unpack the system. So if I was changing the legislation, of course I would look at collateral consequences, and I wouldn't look at the end product of incarceration. I would look at everything that happens up until then. I would look at our communities. I'd look at how we look at each other. I would look at our humanity and ask the questions throughout, who are we, what is justice, and how do we accomplish it? And I would hold first myself accountable. Thank you, Antika. Mm -hmm. Annie. It's interesting. Uh, so this fall in my restorative justice class um, had the privilege of designing one of the classes about our current uh, criminal legal system with somebody I know who is incarcerated right now in Cook County Jail. And as we were planning and kind of designing the class, he said, you know, Annie, the system was created, it's maintained by people who have never been in it. And so as I think about change, it has to involve inclusion. And it has to involve shared power as far as what changes we even need. And so I shouldn't necessarily be the one to provide all the recommendations about um, changes. But we need to, in that process, um, do it as a community, invite others um, to be there as well. Um, and I really do think that it comes down to the idea of sharing power. And that's in terms of resources and support as well. And so often we talk about individual responsibility. And with restorative justice, the shift really has to be to both individual and collective responsibility. And so if we are asking community members to be involved, then we need to make sure that we are providing resources. Some people are getting paid to do that for full-time jobs. Um, but what are we expecting of others and to make sure that there's equity around that as well. So as you see kind of this shared power, making sure that it's also acknowledged in terms of resources <coughs> and support. And something else that I think is crucial and is hard, and this is why we need other people, other voices, is that for there to be healing, that's going to involve the arts, that's going to involve culture, it's going to involve relationships. And for the most part, attorneys aren't the experts in those areas. And so we are going to have to be open to transformation of kind of our systems and what we kind of include as part of um, those. And just one kind of last note is when we think about restorative justice as well, um, I really appreciated what you had to say, Dr. Tyner, and you know, starting with ourselves. Restorative justice, and if we are pushing for more restorative justice, we have to be careful that it is not just a program or diversion that we insert that it's not just a certification or a credential, um, but to look around not only at ourselves, but to say, you know, how are we co-opting restorative justice? Who, who's at the table? Who's not at the table? Um, and so to be very wary about that, even as we advocate for restorative justice, because, you know, how we um, get to change, that process, it matters. Monica, on that last point too, I'm curious what you do in the community to address the inclusion issue and to, to make it more community focused in your restorative justice work. Um, so a lot of times I will not call it restorative justice so much as circle. I genuinely believe in the power of circle. So I've, I facilitate circles of all kinds. Some of them are 
I feel like this is not right. So some of the circles I facilitate are like teachings and workshops about domestic violence and the criminalization of survivors, right? So we'll have, we'll use a, a loose circle format. Um, so when I'm doing a teaching or a workshop, I'll spend like maybe 10 or 15 minutes actually giving facts, right? And then we move into a conversation, right? And so these are people that have been harmed people that have committed harms, oftentimes it's the same people, right? So we are, um, people are complex. We are, I know a lot of people love to quote Brian Stevenson's, we are more than the worst thing that we've ever done. So we say this, but we don't believe this for real about certain people because we are very stuck on victim offender, right? Um, and there's no room for fluidity oftentimes we're bound up in the same in the same being, right? And so it's knowing that as we facilitate circles. And because my office is right on the west side of Chicago, right, which is where most of my work happens from, whatever organization or individuals that I'm collaborating with, that's where most of my work happens, right on the west side. And so the people that I do the work with come from the west side, they're coming from the south side. I'm born and raised in Chicago. We are folks that have been in prison, women who have been victims of all kind of violence, um, people who have caused harm, we, and we're just there. And it kind of happens, it's not, so it's something that I always think about and because it's always there, I'm not always conscious that I'm thinking about it so much as it's a way that I live. I'm gonna be in community with the people that I do this work with because I'm not doing this work for anyone. I'm in community with the people that I do the work with because I am the people that this, all this work is around. For me, this is not theoretical. I'm not coming from someplace else to help or to save so much as it's a part of, it's a way of life, as you were saying, right? It's really and truly a way of life. This business of restoration and healing, business is not the right word, but I'll, it's the best one I can come with. This business of restoration and healing, right? It has to be done in community. Spe specific things that like legislatures and people who have power and resources, housing, invest in communities. Like in Chicago, I'm t our previous mayor, closed down a bunch of schools in the city, closed down all these schools in poor neighborhoods and black neighborhoods and brown neighborhoods, citing lack of funds, and then proposed $95 million to build a cop academy, which is not needed. Our incoming mayor has committed to doing that and more funds, and these, we already have police. Police show up to stuff after the fact. I still believe that it's better to build a world where these harms don't happen. And the way that we do this is to invest in our schools. We don't need more police in schools. We need art classes, music classes, STEM classes, this whole thing, reopen our schools. Housing that people can actually afford to live in, right? There's food security, healthcare, mental health care, reproductive health care. Like there are all these things that we can do that we know are are some of the fixes immediate? And we know for sure it's a long-term solution also. And we can do these things right now. And again, and I said this a little while ago, we can do these things right now today. And a failure to do so is certainly not being in community or being an ally or any of that. So these are like, so whatever spaces you're going back to, if you have a power and access to people that can make those decisions, go do that. So we have a question from the audience uh, for uh, Dr. Tyner. You, you mentioned this uh, youth court. Uh, I'm guessing it's similar to teen court in other places, but could you describe a little bit how, how that works at the, at the school level? At the school level, it would be based then upon a referral. It probably, in most instances, it would come from the prosecutor's office because at that point, it's gone from a disciplinary issue to a criminal issue and is in the court system. From there, then referred as a diversion and a part of how the youth court would work then, you have a jury of your peers, which would be other youth. So I'll use the example in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., then, the jury of your peers are folks who have previously been involved mostly in peer court or youth court themselves. A part of their sentence is to come back and participate. So if we look at this just in a general context from what Ms. Monica's teaching us here, it's people from your own community addressing some of the issues. I was just reading about one of the cases, and there was a young man who stole a car. Terrible, we know we have to address that. And he admitted it, that's the one thing that people don't necessarily pick, on, pick up on related to restorative justice. They say restorative justice is soft on crime. In many instances, it's 
the hardest on crime than anything you could ever imagine. The men that I met with that were convicted of first degree murder for the first time in their lives had to say that out loud. And I know we were the surrogate victims as a part of the community, but they had to say that out loud, notice what I'm saying, and take responsibility for what they did in a different way that the criminal justice system would never require of them. And then that second step of asking how to address the harm. So this young man, going back to that youth court example, stolen a car, you can deal with that through the juvenile justice system. But no one ever asked him why. Those other things Ms. Monica was talking about. What's happening in the community? What's happening in family life? He had just lost his brother to gun violence. No one's going to ask you that at school. In Minnesota, there's 15,000 children, for you educators out there, who have an incarcerated parent. Over 2 million nationwide. No one asks that question. There's only one school that I know of in the entire state that specifically is engaging and asking that question of young people. So when I look at youth court then, it's an opportunity to get beyond the offense. Yes, you can address the offense, but how do you go to the other layer to think about, remember I said the fluid nature sometimes of these terms? How do you get into other complexity around what's happening in the community, what's happening in someone's life, and then to repair the harm, bringing that person back into the fold of the community and thinking about how do we strengthen each other and how do we move forward? So for me, I think youth court offers an opportunity to support learning as an educator because you're learning some of those pro-social skills, you're learning problem-solving skills, and to me it sounds like leadership. And if you want to talk about results, you can look at the reports of our youth court. We have single digit low rates of recidivism afterwards. You have improved academic performance. Why? Because it's a little bit of common sense. Sometimes we think too hard about some of these issues. It's restoring the village and the community and surrounding a young person with that. Can I um, yes. add? Thank you so much, Ms. Artika. Um, In prison, it's like for long timers in prison. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with the language we use. So long timers are those of us that have been locked up for a long time, versus everybody else who has who has not. So for long timers in prison, typically we are locked up for violent crimes, right? Um, in the prison, we do the things that are available for us to do to repair harm, and oftentimes these things get overlooked out here. Um, or they're dismissed and they don't count. And I think this is wrong. So during the time that I was locked up, I was an, I was an incredibly broken person when I, when I first got locked up, right? Um, I knew a woman once I got to the actual prison, because I was in Cook County Jail for three years just pre-trial, right? So when I got to the prison, I met this woman, she's doing natural life. Uh, that's gotta change, right? Uh, she tutors. Right, so she's helped countless, countless people get their GEDs. This woman has also been able to work with other women that were on the mental health unit at the time that were severely, seriously mentally ill, and she's able to work with them in a way that the people that they pay in the prison cannot or will not. I think it's both. I think it's both, right? So she is doing what she can do, what is available to her to do, to make amends. That's where she is. Like we say all the time, meet people where they're at, and who, I don't know who made this quote, I've heard it before, but it's, it's essentially do what you can with what you have where you're at. So whoever said that, this is what we do. We do our best to take care of each other, right, and to help each other. Because in the prison, we do those things that because people are sorry, right? Um, and when I say sorrow, I mean, when I say sorry, I mean that people have sorrow. And it's often assumed out here by people that the sorrow was over the fact that they're in prison. And of course, that's a part of it, because prison is, it's bad. It's not a fantastic place to be. But that sorrow isn't just for being in prison. That sorrow is over everything that led us to this prison. And we can say these things to each other and talk about these things to each other. And we use circle processes all the time, even though we don't think of it that way. But if you're living in a 19, 20 man dorm or a 12 man dorm in the prison, kind of in a circle, right? So we'll have these conversations and we do our best to 
make amends in the ways that are available to us because not a lot is actually offered to us. So we make these things for ourselves. And I have found since coming out, these things are dismissed, overlooked as not a poor, they're somehow disqualified because they happened in the prison with us. And I, I think that this is a mistake and I, I, I think it's worth thinking about for later on, I, if this makes any sense. And I hadn't really thought about it until listening to you. I, so I thank you for this. Thank you. I think it makes very strong sense. Um, Minnesota used to have a, a program called Exploring Justice that was a restorative justice program where uh, students from all of our law schools would on a weekly basis go and meet with inmates typically serving long prison sentences with a facilitator, uh, judges, public defenders, prosecutors would all take turns appearing on each of these weekly <coughs> sessions, always done in a circle. And the rehabilitation uh, benefit of that was tremendous. And because of budget cuts, that's now been eliminated. But that's one of the ways that, that you could um, educate future lawyers about the types of personal experiences and the need to develop empathy and understanding that you're never going to get from reading a, a case Agreed. of a reported criminal uh, decision. Um, we've got a couple questions here. It's a little bit uh, uh, pushing the envelope, but they, uh, they're interested in all three of your views about the whole concept of prison and restorative justice and wondering whether the prison abolition movement or at least the private prison uh, issues that are now being raised uh, in, in uh, cases around the country, whether there's uh, a day that can be seen where wars, restorative justice type efforts will show a, less of a need for prison, uh, have a, a sea change in attitude about how we hold people accountable for wrongdoing. Um, Anybody? Monica? I'll give it a go. So with regard to private prisons, they're bad, but all prisons are bad. And it is actually state prisons that are the biggest driver of mass, they incarcerate more people. More people are in state prisons than federal prisons. Um, state prisons are a super duper large employer, just all the staff that it takes, the correctional staff and other civilian staff of the prison, right? So it is uh, state prisons which get like whatever amount of money they get from the feds to steady operate, right? So just keep the focus on prisons, don't necessarily differentiate between private and public, right? Um, I think this is something that we still do a little bit too much. They're, they're bad, they're ridiculous. Um, I think that these conversations and continuing to think about, not just thinking about it, but really talking about it, diving into, and changing the way that we think about restore, the way that we think and practice restorative justice. I think changes things, has the potential to change a lot of things from the way that we deal with harm to if we learn to deal with harm and build communities that are strong enough to deal with harms and build communities that don't have them, then yeah, we can lessen our reliance on prisons. Um, I am an abolitionist. Um, I grapple a lot with this um, dynamic of prison saved my life that I hear people say. And I, I can relate to this in some ways, but this is like a more complex conversation than we have time for. I'm looking for the time card. Um, <laughs> But I don't think that prisons are ultimately helpful. There are some things I wrestle with because, uh, let me say this, in the 20 years that I was locked up, I have met people in prison who I love, trust, respect. I trust them with the lives of my kids, my grandkids, my cat, and my dog. I've also met prison, people in prison, not so much. The thing that we forget about everybody in prison is that everybody that's in prison right now came from out here somewhere. Nobody sprouted up as a fully formed being on a prison bunk. Everybody that's locked up came from out here somewhere, right? So it's that, it's because I've met people out here that I love and trust and respect that I know have my back. I've also met people out here, not so much. Because again, everybody that's in prison right now came from out, they came from somewhere. They came from Chicago or Vandalia or Champaign or somewhere in Minnesota or New York or wherever. Everybody that's in prison now came from out here. And I think we forget that in this 
othering thing that we do that is so subtle we don't even realize that we're doing it. So it's always being conscious of the things that you're thinking about in this work and thinking about the ways that they contribute to harm. I don't think we need reliance on the prison system at all. At all. Candy? So my hope is that one day we wouldn't need prisons and I try in my work um, to move towards that. Um, but one thing I want to acknowledge is that within kind of the restorative justice movement and people who believe in restorative justice, that not everybody is on the same page and sometimes we need to recognize that and have discussions about that. Um, as far as difference, because to pretend that um, kind of we are all on the same page actually is a disservice. And so I think it's really important when you talk about harm reduction versus abolition um, versus re system reform, um, that we have to have some hard conversations about that and our differences in the restorative justice movement because now is the time to have them, otherwise we're going to see a breakdown in our own relationships. Um, and kind of around this conversation, something that I have really been struck by, no matter what your beliefs are, is the importance of remembering that this is affecting lives of real people. People who have caused harm, people who have been harmed. And sometimes even when you say that, um, it can move into that intellectual, academic, theoretical conversation. Um, but if we can all try to keep that at the forefront. Um, and I've just been reminded about that when sometimes having those conversations, somebody has the courage to raise their hand and share something very personal about where they're coming from as far as harm they've experienced or harm that they've caused. Um, and so as we have kind of these difficult and sometimes uncomfortable conversations, to me it's some, that's something that's critical. I think for me it's something of, of raising questions. Before I can get into my own personal philosophy, maybe it's the educator in me, we have to ask questions like, what was the purpose of the criminal justice system? Have we moved further away from its origins? What are the qualities? What type of services are provided? Could you imagine I was a certified student attorney in the prosecutor's office, and arguably I had the ability to send someone to 30 to 60 days, and my father was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. I'm like, I did well in law school, sir. I'm doing all right. He was like, no, because you've never been in a prison. He was like, have you spent a night in a prison and you're just loosely saying that person should get 30 days, that person should get 60, 90? So when you think about that, I would say, I know what my personal answer is, but as an educator, I create platforms to engage in critical thinking. So I would ask my students, and those of you in the audience, I see many of you, have you visited a prison? Have you had the opportunity to go to a circle? Judge Cohen took me to the Hmong sentencing circle, to the Frogtown circle that was dealing with some of the drug disparities. It was eye-opening for me. I also have to ask you when we throw out the word abolitionist, we're like, whoa, that's jarring. But I want you to go to your dictionary. I want you to look up two words. I want you to look up what it means to be an ally and what it means to be an abolitionist. And you come up with your own answer based upon that. If you're concerned about policing and you don't know what's going on, you don't know why, know why people are protesting and marching in the streets for their humanity for Black Lives Matter, guess what? You go on a police ride along. So for me, I, I don't want to give a specific answer because I think, once again, it all has to start in your own personal journey, your own personal experience. And law school gives us a lot of power and it gives us a lot of deference. But I think we have to equip ourselves to ask with power and privilege, what's our responsibility? So I think it's unpacking some critical questions. In, in, in that vein, uh, when I first came to St. Thomas and started teaching the Crime and Punishment course, one of the things I would introduce the course uh, uh, to the students was a, a statistic that at that time, this is 2008, we had five states in this country that were spending more money on corrections, on locking people up than they were on higher education. And I would ask the students, I don't care what your political philosophy is or even your views about punishment. What's the future of a state that locks, spends more money locking people up than educating the next generation? And the, the jarring statistic 
that I offer now, uh, that number has risen uh, in the last 10 years to 16 states. 16 states, um, and they are significant states. New York, California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, Arizona, and quite recently, Wisconsin. Now, Minnesota has a different track record, as many of you probably know here. And we have a, a uh, much different ratio, but we still have our issues uh, in terms of the funding priorities that we're gonna devote to changing and improving the criminal justice system. And I am convinced that uh, the types of things you've heard about today and that you'll hear about uh, later this afternoon are steps in not only the right direction, but in a necessary direction. Um, one final point, uh, do, well, I think we have like a, a, a short period uh, without breaking uh, into the break too much. Do you want to give a closing comment, something that you hope people will remember a year from now about your views of this entire topic? Artiki, you want to go first? Yes, I'll go with more homework to my students and to the audience. If you haven't read this yet, I highly recommend it. Where do we go from here, chaos or community? It's the final book that was written by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the reason why I bring this up in my closing statement is because you have the opportunity to choose. It's bigger than restorative justice. It's choosing what type of lawyer you wanna be. It's choosing based upon being here at the University of St. Thomas, what's your personal mission? How does your faith guide you? What direction are you headed? And my challenge for you is to ask more questions and I know I'm an English major, so I'm biased about punctuation. I'm real strict on it when I'm grading papers, okay? But think about it this way. Oftentimes we end with a statement with a period. I believe because one student said, because I'm a Catholic with a capital C. I said, I'd hate to meet the lowercase Catholic. Because I had no idea what he meant by that. And then another student was like, I believe because I'm progressive. Another student, I believe because I'm conservative. Leave all that at home and let's focus on how do we build systems that are transformative and how do we build the type of community that we want to live in. Last point that I wanted to conclude with is that when we started to look at this data, I was telling you about the high rate and the disparities and representation of students of color in the juvenile justice system and being referred out of the school system. One thing that I didn't tell you about, which I wanted to leave this to the, for the very end, is the reality of once we did the research, what did we find? Right here in the state of Minnesota through the Organizing Apprenticeship Project, we found right away that similarly situated people the only difference was how much melanin they had in their skin would then determine the harshness of their sentence. There's some things we can do about that. And we can't say we're colorblind, we don't see race. Yes, we do. Race matters in everything that we do. So I'm challenging us to start with the man, the woman in the mirror. I'm borrowing a little bit from Michael Jackson. And ask ourselves some critical questions of what do we see? And how can we create the type of world that we want to live in? Because we can't say it can't be done. Juvenile justice, go to New Zealand. I had a student that went there to study. They're using restorative justice as a default. They're not talking about juvenile detention. They're talking about how restorative justice can be a way of life. So I think a part of this is doing our homework, looking critically at ourselves, and being a part of building a better world. Annie. Amen. <laughs> um, I would say embrace complexity. It's not a black and white world. And we also have to embrace discomfort because that's where we are right now. So if it's not uncomfortable, you might have to look around and say, um, are we really dealing with issues? And it's important that we look at the structural, the collective, the historical harms and work on equally repairing those um, when we think about advocating for justice. And lastly, I would say build relationships. Work on being in community um, with those who are around you and also those who are not. And that's going to require a lot more work. Come on. Oh, I don't even know how to top those. Um, my book recommendation is a book called The Long Term. Um, edited by Alice Kim, Erica Miners, Beth Ritchie, and Sarah Ross. The long term. Get that book. Um, and the quote that I want to share is actually by Starhawk. It's from a book. It's from a book called Dreaming the Dark. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. 
Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. So a couple of quick announcements, and I'd like to show our appreciation to our panel. There will be mass uh, at noon in the chapel, which is right down the hall. Uh, food will start being served about 12.15. And for anybody who's interested in the name tag, there are name tags over at the registration table. Um, but let's show our appreciation to our panelists. <laughs> everybody let's uh, try and get started here so we can sort of stay on schedule uh, uh, my name is Hank Shea many of you uh, heard from me already this morning but it's my honor and privilege to welcome back Jean Bishop to the University of St. Thomas School of Law this is uh, at least the fourth time that we have had her come back and speak in this atrium and I want to thank the Holleran Center and we have Tom and Patty Holleran with us today for each time uh, sponsoring her uh, trip up from Chicago to, to join us. We also should uh, express some gratitude to the Murphy Institute because they sponsored the lunch that you just all enjoyed. So thank you to both of them. Jean's a bio is in the program and I could go on at length about her. Um, she is a longtime public defender in, in Chicago. But uh, the two things I'll, I'll touch on are the, the two books that have brought her to St. Thomas. Uh, she came here uh, several years ago to speak about her first book, Change of Heart, Justice, Mercy, and Making Peace with My Sister's Killer. And what I did then is what I'll do now. I'm just going to read from three people's observations about the book. Uh, you've heard about one of them already today, Brian Stevenson, uh, the director and founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and also a, a noted author in his own right regarding just mercy. This is what Brian Stevenson said about Jean Bishop and her first book. This book is an extraordinary witness for survivors of crime and all of us who seek a more compassionate, thoughtful, and responsible way to manage the tragic ways that we hurt each other. Courageous and honest, Miss Bishop's compelling story is a gift for anyone seeking a way to think about punishment and reconciliation in a society where families are too often burdened by violence and the avenging politics of fear and anger. Another person you may have heard of, John Grisham, a noted author, had this to say about Change of Heart. Change of Heart is a tragic story of senseless violence, horrific loss, and in the end, forgiveness that is astonishing. I kept asking myself, as a Christian, could I be as strong and merciful as Jean Bishop? I have my doubts. And then finally, someone who we've been fortunate to have speak uh, at this law school, Sister Helen Prejean, author of Dead Man Walking, said this, the criminal justice system in the United States which deems some people unworthy of redemption, even children who commit serious crimes, urgently needs to hear voices that speak of mercy and restoration. Jean Bishop is such a voice. So today we're going to hear some about the former book, but the reason we brought her up is for the, the first time we will get a preview of her upcoming book, which we published the next April the 25th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. It is a grace from the rubble, two fathers roads to reconciliation after the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, questions, we hope that you'll ask, please put them on note cards and they'll be brought up and Jean's devoted uh, uh, some time at the end to answer questions. She also has been battling a, a sore throat for several days here. 
So if there's an instance where she needs to take a break, I assured her we would all understand, and I will uh, get up and do a tap dance in the interim. So let's uh, all welcome Jean Bishop. Thank you again for being here. I actually want to see that tap dance. Although I did go to Mass before and prayed that I would not start coughing. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I feel so grateful to be back here at St. Thomas. This is a place that more than any place I know lives out its mission to integrate faith and reason in the search for truth, focusing on morality and social justice. I mean, you see it everywhere in what you do in the Community Justice Center and the Immigration Clinic and Professor Mark Osler's first in the country federal clemency clinic here. And, and this conference today, I think that all of us have been so moved by this morning and the, the other speakers, I can only say thank you to all of them and, and to Miss Monica, the, the heart of this day for me. So thank you. Um, a special thank you to Hank Shea, who is irreplaceable and this conference, this symposium is just the latest in a long line of uh, good works that he's done throughout his life and career and this relentless determination to do justice in a better way. So thank you, Hank. So Hank mentioned this, yes, yes. This is the first time I've told this story in public and I can't think of a more perfect place to do it, so thank you. And it starts the way all good stories do, once upon a time. Once upon a time, there were three families. The family, my family, I'm one of three girls, three daughters in the family. We grew up in Oklahoma City, this heartland place that was settled by pioneers and lived this philosophy of neighbor helping neighbor. Another family was Bud Welch. Bud is a gas station owner from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He had two sons and one daughter. And Bill McVeigh, an auto parts worker from Western New York, had three children, two daughters and a son. Bud, Bill, and I are linked by tragedy. Each of us lost a family member to a deliberate killing, and each of them died young. The first to die was my sister Nancy. At the age of 25, when she was three months pregnant, Nancy and her husband Richard were coming home from a family dinner celebrating the announcement of her pregnancy, only to find a, a killer waiting for her in the dark. He handcuffed Richard. He took them down to the basement. He shot Richard once in the head, execution style, and then shot my pregnant sister in her stomach twice and left her there to die. The second to die, four years later, five years later to the month, was 23-year-old Julie Marie Welch, the only daughter of Bud Welch. She was fluent in Spanish and she worked as an interpreter for the Social Security Administration on the first floor. And she was killed when an explosion killed her and 167 other innocent people, men, women, and children, in the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. And then six years later, the last to die of the children was the only son of Bill McVeigh, Timothy McVeigh. He was 26 years old when he planted that bomb and he was executed for his crime by the federal government six years later. The nexus between us, between me, Bud, and Bill, is Oklahoma City, this place broken but unbowed by evil. Oklahoma City lost its children too. There were 19 children that were killed in that bombing, 15 from the daycare and another four in other parts of the building. Love didn't leave me in the place I was when Nancy and Richard were first murdered, when I was fine with throwing away the life of the young man who had done the crime, a 16-year-old boy who pulled that trigger. Love led me instead to a mailbox where I stood with a letter in hand to that young man, writing to him in prison, telling him I had forgiven him, and reaching out to reconcile with him. It was in the course of that, that trek from fear to freedom that I found these heroes of reconciliation to me, Bud and Bill. Sometimes we imagine that it's facts and argument that change people's minds and hearts, but as a lawyer, I know that isn't true. It really is stories that change people's minds and hearts that transform us. This story I'm about to tell you 
is such a story. It's a story of these two fathers that found each other in the tangled aftermath of this bombing and found um, that vengeance only begets vengeance and hate only begets hate. But reconciliation is different, that it heals us and heals our world one human heart at a time. These two fathers should have been enemies. Earthly reason would have dictated so, but that is not what happened. So I'm gonna take you back to April 19th, 1995, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And here in Minneapolis and I, where I live in Chicago in April, it's usually still freezing cold and we still have our sweaters and, and parkas on. But in Oklahoma City, it was a beautiful warm spring day that day, the kind of day that you roll down your car windows and you wear your shirt sleeves to work. The mayor's prayer breakfast had just let out and people were going into their offices uh, to work. Um, there was a woman named Florence Rogers who worked in the credit union on the third floor. And she was convening a, women, uh, a meeting of eight young women who were working with her in the, the credit union. A guy named Dan Weber, who was a young law clerk, had just dropped off his 18-month-old son at the daycare on the second floor. It was called America's Kids Daycare. And there was a woman named Sheila Driver who was pregnant, who was going into her office. And Julie Marie Welch walked into her first floor office on the first floor of the Social Security Administration. She had just come from mass at her church, St. Charles Borromeo in Oklahoma City. Um, Julie was a daily communicant the last two years of her life. And she started a preschool class for kids who had just moved to Oklahoma from Mexico who didn't speak English because Julie was fluent in Spanish and she loved the children and they loved her. But she was looking forward to another job. She was hoping to be a Spanish teacher and had gotten a job offer for that fall. She was also looking ahead to getting engaged to her longtime boyfriend, Air Force Lieutenant Eric Hiltz. That morning, Julie's dad was at home. He hadn't gone yet to his job at the Texaco station on 39th Street. He um, uh, was a protective dad. He was a dad that when Julie went to college called her every day. Um, far away in um, western New York in a town called Pendleton, Bill McVeigh was getting ready to go and um, do, sorry, he had just gotten home from his overnight shift on the plant. He worked for a GM factory manufacturing radiators. It's a job he held for almost 40 years. And Bill McVeigh is a guy who belongs to things, not just his UAW union, but his Catholic church where he ran the bingo, the veterans association in the town where he helped do the books, the Little League, the fire company where he was a volunteer. He didn't know then that at that moment his only son, Tim, was driving a rider truck that he had rented loaded full of explosives, driving it to the very building where Julie Marie worked, this nine-story, multi-million dollar glass and steel building, the Murrah Federal Building. He had packed the um, truck with ammonium nitrate. He had designed two fuses, one to take five minutes to burn and the other to take two, so that if one failed, the other one would set it off. All he needed was an ordinary cigarette lighter to light it. The truck was also full of hate. Timothy McVeigh hated the federal government. He wanted to strike a blow against it as retaliation and revenge for what he saw as the excesses of the government against his own citizens. And particularly, he was angered over the deaths of 76 men, women, and children in a conflagration in Waco, Texas. There was a standoff between the ATF and FBI and this cult called the Branch Divinians in this compound. And when the ATF launched tear gas into the compound and the fire started, all of these in people inside um, died. So McVeigh had picked the exact second anniversary of that conflagration in Waco to set off the bomb in Oklahoma City at this federal building. So we know that profile, the young, angry, white male, armed and ready to do violence. And he learned that hate when he was in the army and met his two co-conspirators, Terry Nichols and Michael Fortier. Nichols was a guy who was raised in this kind of militia you know, area of Michigan, very anti-government, tried to renounce his US citizenship, tore up his passport and IDs, 
when he was brought to court for not paying his, his debts and his credit cards or his child support, he said that the court didn't have jurisdiction over him. Fortier lived in this place called Kingman, Arizona, which is a hotbed of anti-government militias, um, and um, had a flag flying outside his trailer that said, don't tread on me, meaning the, the government stay away. Um, so McVeigh pulled up this truck to the loading area by the building, right by the first floor where Julie worked, just underneath the windows to the second floor daycare. He lit the fuses. He put earplugs in his own ears because he had prepared so thoroughly that he knew that he needed that to ward off the hearing damage that might come from the loud sound of the bomb. I think you'll recall that in the Boston Marathon bombing, one of the really gruesome injuries besides people losing their legs and being maimed in other ways that so many people went, were rendered deaf from the explosion of the bomb. So McVeigh brought earplugs to protect his own ears. At that moment, Julie had been working in the back in a stock room with three other women. And she was called to the front because there was an appointment. There was a man named Emilio Tapio Rangel who didn't speak English and who needed her help in doing uh, the business he needed to do at the Social Security office. And so she was called to the front. All three of the young women who stayed back in that closet working survived. They were rescued 45 minutes later. So Julie didn't know when she was going to the front that she was going to her doom, that the dreams of teaching that class of Spanish or of marrying Eric would, would never be. At 9.02, the bomb went off. The spark had met the charge and the wider truck exploded with an almost unimaginable force. And I just want to read to you from the official record of the Oklahoma City bombing what happened when that truck exploded. The first wave of super hot gas moved at 7,000 miles per hour, fast enough that someone 10 feet away would have been hit by a force of 37 tons. In about a half second, the gas dissipated, only to be replaced by an equally violent vacuum. The resulting pressure wave moved outward, lifting the building up and causing beams, floor slabs, and connections to weaken or collapse. When the pressure wave passed, gravity took over. Nine stories on the north side of the building pancaked, creating a crater some 30 feet deep. So the whole front of the glass, the building, sheared off. People who survived the bombing remember seeing people across from them doing their flinging their arms up in the air as if they were doing the wave at a football game. In fact, they were falling through space. People on the ninth floor ended up on the first. Um, after uh, the bombing had uh, happened and people were being recovered, bodies were being recovered, the dentists who were identifying people by dental records recall everyone's face looking like Edward Munch's The Scream, that painting where like that because the force of the air had blown into their lungs and frozen them in death in this last ghastly expression. The young women in the credit union, all eight of them, disappeared before Florence Rogers' eyes. All eight of them died. Florence alone survived, clinging to this precipice of about 14 inches on a ledge that once had been the floor of her office. Dan Weber, ran when he heard the explosion, ran from his own da damaged office a few blocks away, ran to the second floor, you know, um, a kind of a plaza that was right by the second floor where he had dropped off his only child, his little son. And everything he saw there was, there was no more second floor. There was only this pile of rubble. He saw these tiny shoes sticking out, the shoes of his son, and an officer helped pull out this child, and he was alive, one of only six of the children pulled alive. And he told a newspaper let later that it was like losing everything that mattered to you and then having it given back again. Sheila Driver was buried in rubble and the first responders who showed up were asking her to talk, to say her name. And they were elated when they pulled her out alive and were devastated later when they found that she had died on the way to the hospital. Even though it took first responders days and even weeks to go through finding everyone's remains, they found no survivors after that first day. Everyone was dead. Miles away, back at home, Bud Welch heard this enormous boom. And he was there with his son, and they said, what is that? And then the phone rang, and it was Bud's brother, Frank. 
And he said, turn on the TV, there's been a, some kind of explosion downtown. And Bud said that when he saw the front of the building, his heart just sank because he knew that's exactly where Julie would have worked and where she would have been. Right then at that moment, Bill McVeigh was getting ready to go out and do the bingo at his church, his Catholic church, Good Shepherd Church in Lockport, New York. And the news came on about this catastrophe in Oklahoma City, and he thought maybe it was a gas explosion. But when he got to the bingo that night, the ladies that were there told him that no, it had been a deliberate attack. And he didn't yet know that his own son had been the attacker. The bombing shocked the nation and the world. It was the deadliest strike on American soil since Pearl Harbor. It is still the most deadly domestic act of terrorism in the nation's history at 168 people dead. And it happened in this modest city where I grew up, this place of farmers, ranchers that would plow your field if you got sick or took care, take care of uh, you if your barn burned down. And Oklahomans are used to having catastrophe come at them from the sky, from tornadoes, from the dust bowl that ravaged crops in the 30s, from the hail that would dent your car if you parked it in the driveway you know, overnight. They weren't used to having catastrophe come at them from the ground, from a place as ordinary as a man parking a truck on the street. Oklahoma City responded with unity and love. There was an immediate outpouring of help from everyone. When the dogs that were sniffing for survivors were breaking their, were hurting their paws on broken glass, the word went out and all these paw protectors would come in. The first responders who came from other places, from New York City, from as far away as California and from the south, came and checked out of a hotel or tried to pay for the meal they'd just eaten at a restaurant. They found that no one in Oklahoma City would take their money. The nickname they, they called it is the Oklahoma dollar, that the same dollar they came with is the one they left with, because there was such gratitude for the help that came in. When the credit union where Florence Rogers and those eight women worked was blown apart, all the cash in their vaults went floating out into the street. The people in Oklahoma City returned all the money, such that the money they got back was actually more than what had been lost from the vault. The buildings all around within like a 30 block radius had all their windows blown out and crashed to the ground, including the banks. The cash drawers were left open and they were untouched. There was not a single act of looting. The tale of how Timothy McVeigh, the nation's worst domestic terrorist, was apprehended is actually the story of a civil servant, an ordinary uh, civil servant, doing his job faithfully and well. So when Timothy McVeigh left the bombing site, he got into a beat-up Mercury that he had planted as a getaway car, and he'd taken the license plates off the back. And so when Trooper Charlie Hanger saw this Mercury driving on I-35 and had no license tag, he pulled it over. And when he saw the outline of the Glock that Tim McVeigh had strapped to him, he put a, his gun up and said, you know, you're under arrest because it was unlawful to be carrying a loaded gun in a car at that time in Oklahoma. So Trooper Hanger placed Timothy Mouvet under arrest and took him to this little town called Perry, Oklahoma in Noble County and put him in the jail on four misdemeanor charges where he probably would have been let go uh, if not for a fluke. Because the town was so small, the judge that was there um, wasn't available that first night to that first day um, to have a bond hearing for McVeigh, so it was held to the next day. And the next day, the judge's son was late for the bus, and so that put it off, too. By this time, the FBI had found the axle tr uh, of the rider truck and was able to link it to a guy um, who had rented this truck. And they got this sketch of this sharp-featured young man with a buzz cut and they took it to Harrington, Kansas, where the truck was rented and walked all around the town and asked, you know, has anybody seen this guy? And a woman from the Dreamland Motel, where Timothy McVeigh had stayed the night before the bombing, said, yes, I recognize him. And she showed the ledger where he'd signed in under his own name, Timothy McVeigh. They ran his name through a database and were stunned to discover that there was a Timothy McVeigh in custody in Little Noble County Jail. The FBI got on the phone and yelled, hold him, hold him. And they rushed there to place him under arrest. And 
they transferred him to federal custody. And some of you old enough to remember will remember this indelible moment in American history when this sharp-featured young white male with a buzz cut in an orange jumpsuit is taken out into daylight, blinking in the sun. And the crowd that had gathered when they heard that the person who committed this heinous crime was in custody gathered to yell at him, baby killer, murderer. Bud Welch had the TV on at that time, and he saw that perp walk of Timothy McVeigh. And he hoped at that moment that the sniper would just take him out right there. He hoped for a, a Jack Ruby moment. Remember when John F. Kennedy was assassinated and Lee Harvey Oswald was placed under arrest. And as he's being transported by law enforcement, someone stepped forward and just shot him dead right there. And the death penalty wasn't fast enough for Bud Welch. He wanted Timothy McVeigh dead. The day after Tim's arrest, the FBI flew Bill McVeigh from Pendleton, New York, to Oklahoma City to talk to him to see if there was anything that Tim might tell him about who else might have helped him do this. And despite Bill's efforts, he, he, Tim refused to say anything. And that same day, that Saturday, Bud got the terrible news he'd been expecting that Julie's body had been found in the rubble. He and his wife and uh, Julie's boyfriend, Eric, went to see her at the mortuary. The whole left side of her head had been crushed in. Her neck was broken. Her foot was almost severed. severed. She had lacerations all over her face. And it wasn't until then Bud said that he really accepted that his, his only daughter, his baby, was dead. And when that happened, he just descended into darkness. He was drinking, almost blackout drinking, every night. He was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day, nonstop. And he was obsessively going day after day to the ruins of the Murrah building. By now, it's surrounded by this chain link fence that was people would leave teddy bears and candles and things on. And his customers at the Texaco station said, like, Bud, you're killing yourself. And he said, the sooner I die, the sooner I get to heaven and see my daughter Julie again. Um, but over time, Bud realized that this wasn't healing him, that all of his hate and all of his desire for revenge was actually killing him. He started thinking about why had Timothy McVeigh done this. And when he found that it was just really retaliation and revenge for Waco, he said, well, retaliation, revenge, bloodshed tit for tat, it will never end. And so he had a change of heart about what he wanted, you know, that he no longer wanted revenge or he wanted instead to reach out and forgive Timothy McVeigh. By this time, McVeigh's case had been wandering through the courts. Um, it was transferred from Oklahoma to Colorado for trial because it was agreed by everyone that the man this hated for this heinous crime could not possibly get a fair trial in the state of Oklahoma. So he was found guilty, and then he was sentenced to death despite Bill's pleas to spare his son. So before he was going to be executed, the journalist Ed Bradley from 60 Minutes convened a handful of survivors of the Oklahoma City bombing victims, including Bud Welch, asking them, you know, if you had a chance to talk to Timothy McVeigh before he was executed, what would you say to him? And the first guy said, I'd say, Tim, why don't you be a man and tell us, you know, who else was in on it? We don't believe you, you know, it was only you. And then a woman said, I would just, you know, beg him to, you know, tell us more, that kind of thing. And then Ed Bradley turned to Bud, and Bud said, what I'd want to do is I'd want to take a picture of my daughter Julie and show it to him. And I'd point out to him that they were about the same age. And if they'd grown up in the same neighborhood, they possibly would have been buddies. And I want so much for him to ask for forgiveness before he dies. And Bradley looked absolutely stunned by that, just stunned that what he wanted was not an answer and not revenge, but that what he wanted was that moment of forgiveness. And Bud and I have spoken together a lot against the death penalty over the years. That's how we know each other best. And Bud always says that it's a hole in his heart, a hole in his heart that he never got, not only to maybe hear you know, Tim's request for forgiveness, but for him to offer it no matter what just to first say, I forgive you. So Bud and Bill never met during the trial. Bud didn't really want to go to much of the trial. 
And Bill didn't want to go for much either, so they had never met. But Bud saw him early on in the process, right after the bombing and the arrest of Tim McVeigh. Bud remembered seeing him on the TV news. And the news camera had gone to Bill McVeigh's home. He's got this big garden in this big backyard in this rural area of western New York where he grows corn and potatoes and peas and things and gives it away to his neighbors for free. And Bill was stooped working in his garden, and Bud said he didn't even remember what Bill said, but he remembered when he turned to look at the camera and Bill looked up in the camera that Bud could see this pain, this deep, deep pain in Bill McVeigh's eyes. And he swore to himself that one day he would go to that grieving father and tell him that he understood how he felt. So when Bud wasn't able to meet with Timothy McVeigh before he died, he decided to reach out to Bill McVeigh instead. And he did it through a Catholic nun named Sister Roz, Sister Rosalind Rosendlowski, who is a chaplain at the Attica Prison in New York. That's her day job. Her night job is working at a kind of a halfway house, a reentry place for people who are being released on parole. And Bud got in touch with her and asked, you know, assuming that she would know every Catholic in Western New York, that, you know, did she know Bill McVeigh? She sought him out. And she brokered this meeting in a beautiful sunny day in September. Um, Bud drove out to see Bill McVeigh. They walked in Bill's garden. They talked. They sat at Bill's kitchen table. And they learned all these things they had in common. Both of them, very faithful Catholics, had gone, come from big Irish Catholic families, both of them. Bud's one of eight children. Um, they'd both grown up on farms and had that in common. They both had gone to Catholic schools all the way through high school. Neither one went to college, both working men, but at the gas station, Bill working the furnace on the overnight shift at the factory. They each had three children. Both of them had been divorced, and both of them had lost this dear child that they, that they loved. They had this incredible reconciliation. That's the only family member that Bill has ever had visited his house, the only one he stayed in touch with. They are, um, they are enduring friends. Why does this matter for us? It matters because we have to learn how to respond to evil, because there's been no shortage of evil since that attack, right? We've had Newtown and Parkland and El Paso and Dayton and Tree of Life Synagogue and Mother Emmanuel Baptist Church in Charleston. And we know that we have to respond. And if our response is hatred and vengeance, that will get us nowhere. It will just cause more bloodshed. We have the example of Bud and Bill, of what restorative justice looks like. It looks like two people sitting down together and talking and understanding one another. The story matters because, to me, it shows the futility of responding to violence with more violence. We executed Timothy McVeigh on June 11, 2001, and it was an execution he went to voluntarily. He was a volunteer. He withdrew his own appeals. He did not want to spend the rest of his life in prison, according to his dad. And one of the things he told journalists before he died, he said, you know, they think they've got me. You know, they, I'm some kind of trophy that with the death penalty they've won. He said, they haven't won. By the crudest terms, 168 to 1. And we know what he meant by that, right? I killed 168 people, and you're killing me. And so if it's supposed to be an eye for an eye, by your own math, I win. So he's killed, executed June 11, 2001. And three months later to the day, terrorists slammed airplanes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and the field in Pennsylvania. It did nothing to deter that act. The street, I think, matters because it teaches us that people can change. Bud went from hating Timothy McVeigh and wanting him dead to reaching out in forgiveness to him. And if he can change, so can anyone. I think, too, the story matters because of, of you, of all of you, that you do not have to be transformed by evil or defeated by it. You don't have to become a hater because of hatred. 
We can transform this cycle of retaliation and revenge. We can turn brokenness into unity and peace into strife. And we can go out into this world redeeming it and making it whole. And may God bless you in the work that you do. Yeah, so uh, the 16-year-old boy who killed my family members um, started out, you know, denying the crime, totally remorseless, that took the stand at his trial and lied and said that someone else had done it when, in fact, he had. Um, and so for years, you know, I had thought that forgiving him was enough, like doing that in my own mind and heart and not reaching out to him at all because my forgiveness was really for God and for Nancy and for me. You know, I, it was... It was for God because we know as Christians that we're called on to forgive. We just said it in Mass and the Our Father that we say, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I forgave for Nancy because she was this loving, generous, kind-hearted um, person. And I just didn't believe that her memorial should be hatred and vengeance. It needed to be something life-giving and healing and restoring. And so I spent, you know, decades working against gun violence and working against the death penalty and anything that shed more blood or dug another grave of an innocent person. And I forgave for me because of this saying I write about in my book that hating another person is like drinking poison and expecting that other person to die. And I didn't want to give him that power over me. But what I was challenged to see after meeting your law professor, Professor Mark Osler, who gave me a book written by one of his colleagues at an institution he taught at before here, Baylor, that every Christian man and woman has an obligation to try to work to reconcile with those who've wronged them. And when I read that, I was really challenged to reach out and write to David Biro, the, the young man who killed my family members, and say, you know, I forgave you a long time ago, and I told the whole world, except you, the most important person of all. And I've waited all this time for you to apologize to me. I'm, I'm going to go first. I'm sorry. And I, I'll come see you if you want. And he wrote me back this incredible 15-page letter confessing to the crime for the first time and saying how very, very sorry he was. And it has been so healing for me to go and sit with him, to hear him tell me things about Nancy's last moments that were so helpful to know and for me to be able to talk about Nancy, because the more he gets to know her, he says, the sorrier he is for what he did. And that's the, the best justice he can give me. How about in terms of uh, him and his bay? Oh. Yeah, so the, the question is, you know, did Timothy McVeigh ever show any regret for what he'd done? You know, his father begged him to because he knew how much it might mean to some of the victims' families, especially the parents of the children, for him to say that he was sorry. And he was steadfast to the last in not doing that. I think he perceived it as some kind of weakness to have done that. Um, but on the way to the, the death chamber, he was speaking to a chaplain. And later the warden told Bill McVeigh, Tim's dad, that he had sought forgiveness at the end. So um, I asked Bill when I was interviewing him for the book, you know, do you, th do you hope to see Tim in heaven someday? And he said, yes, I hope so. And he said, I pray for him every day. And I asked him, well, what, what do you pray? 
<coughs> and he looked at me like, no. And I realized I, I crossed this line that, that those prayers are precious uh, to Bill and to God, whose son forgave a, a thief on the cross next to him. Gene, some students are going to wonder, they, they don't know your whole career progression, but you were working for a big law firm downtown Chicago, and then after the, uh, the, the murder of your sister and brother-in-law, you became a public defender, which you've been doing for quite some time now. How does somebody make that type of career change, and, and, and what, what do you say to others who um, have similar questions about where they should be devoting their, their career and their profession? Yeah, so I um, started out my career as a corporate associate um, because I was, this is so ironic, because I was scared to get up and talk in front of people. So I thought, well, this is something where I won't have to get up and talk in front of people. I'll just be working on documents. But the thing is, I was cheating my employer, and we're supposed to work for them as if for God. I was cheating them because it wasn't deeply meaningful to me. I didn't care deeply about it, and consequently, I think I was probably terrible at it. Um, and what I really found joy in was the pro bono work I was able to do at the firm, representing uh, Central American refugees uh, seeking political asylum, uh, working for nonprofit organizations, and um, finding that joy of really doing something useful in the world for a, a real human that I could, I could see instead of just kind of documents with zeros at the end. And so when Nancy died at the age of 25, I was just a few years older than her. And I realized that she had lost her life and I was going to go on. I was going to have this gift of life that she no longer had been given. And I'd already been on the planet a couple of years longer than her and I had wasted it. I had wasted it doing on something that wasn't deeply meaningful. And that's when I immediately you know, left the corporate law and within months started my work as a public defender where I've been ever since. And what I would say to the wonderful young people you know, at this law school and from other schools is that your life is short. Nancy did not know when she came home from that dinner last night that that would be the last day, her last day on earth. And you have to do what you love and what matters deeply to you. Don't be afraid of anything. Don't listen to that voice in my head that I listen to saying, oh, I have student loans to pay. and. You know, what will I do? I need to take the highest paying job. Do what you believe in. There's a question about uh, people who are sentenced to life in prison as juveniles. It's been working its way. The Supreme Court has now spoken several times. Um, in the case of David Biro, um, and I haven't kept up, but I know that um, there were some who who uh, were critical of your outreach to David Biro because it occurred shortly after the first favorable court decision, is my recollection, uh, opening the door to the possibility of release, <clears throat> even though they had received life without uh, parole type sentences. And I know you've met with David Biro since then. Where do you stand right now if you were uh, on a parole board or if you were part of the decision-making process about whether someone like David Biro should ever be released? So um, David has an unusual life without parole sentence. So in my state, the state of Illinois, back at the time he was sentenced, there still was such thing as a death penalty for juveniles in other states. We didn't have one in Illinois, but in Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Missouri, they did have one. And so that's actually one of the things the press wanted to know when my family and I emerged from David's sentencing to life without parole, like, aren't you disappointed he didn't get the death penalty? And that's when we were able to say, no, you know, we don't believe in shedding more blood and digging another grave and creating this other grieving family. But the life sentences he got were two. He got a mandatory life sentence for killing the two adults. That was an automatic sentence, meaning that the judge had no power to give him any sentence but that once he was convicted of it. He was also, though, given a discretionary life sentence from the judge for killing the unborn baby because Nancy and Richard had told him she was pregnant uh, before he shot them to death. They'd actually, you know, Richard had said, please don't hurt my wife, she's expecting, so he knew. Um, when that 
case that you referred to happened, that was Miller versus Alabama in 2012. That only struck down the mandatory sentence. So when David Bureau and I met, he had no hope whatsoever still of getting out of prison, uh, regardless of what happened with Miller, because his discretionary life sentence for killing the baby still, still stands. Now that sentence is being challenged, and I don't believe in juvenile life sentences anymore, and I don't even believe, certainly not mandatory, and I don't even believe in them as a discretionary matter either. And that's just been argued before the US Supreme Court in a case that I am on an amicus brief with other family members of murder victims. On the Malvo case, it was a young juvenile who, with an adult, kind of terrorized the Washington, D.C., Virginia area with these just random sniper shootings. So they're, we're challenging now the, the giving of a sentence to any child, but saying that because you did this, now we will put you away forever without any second look at you. It's, it's merciless and it's wrong. So we don't uh, often talk about love in law school. We had that uh, said earlier today, and it's very true. Yeah. But uh, I want you to make some closing comments here. But one thing I would like you to add, it's always uh, been one of the most powerful parts of your first book for me, is to, to tell everybody here what your sister did in her last moments on earth. Yeah, so. Richard died right away when he was shot, execution style. But Nancy, the coroner said, lived on for about 10 minutes. And first she tried to call for help. And it's so unimaginable. But in 1990, when she was murdered, there's no such thing as a cell phone. She didn't have any way to call for help. So she tried to make noise with this tool. She was banging on a shelf that was in the basement with this metal tool. And I just imagine that at some point she must have known that no help was coming and that, that she was dying. So she dragged herself by her elbows over to where Richard's body lay on the floor because she was too weak to stand. And she dipped her finger in her own blood and she drew on the concrete floor next to him the shape of a heart and the letter U. Love you. This is how she used to sign her cards and letters to him. And to me, it was not just her message to him, this man that she loved so much and wanted to raise a family with and grow old with. It was, I think, her benediction on this world and for all of us that, that she was leaving. And what I really loved about that when I found out, because the police didn't tell us till about a week later, that detail. When my mom heard it, she burst into tears and she said, it's true, isn't it? Love is stronger than death. And when I heard it, I thought, Wow, when the killer fled, I bet he thought he'd silenced her forever and had the last word, and he didn't. She did. She had the last word that night, and that word was love. And I believe it will always be the last word on our lives. It will always be the most powerful force on earth, stronger than hate, stronger than any division there can be, or any problem we have to surmount. And that's why I hope that we start talking about love a lot more in law schools and everywhere. Thank you so much. A 10 minute break, and then we'll have our final panel for the day. To the final panel of the day, my name's uh, Tom Johnson, and I'm, I'm really excited about moderating this panel. And I'm excited because when you think about what happened here, and look back five years ago, the parties that are sitting up here were at uh, serious odds. Uh, they were involved in some serious litigation, both civil and criminal. Uh, that was begun by the Ramsey County Attorney's Office under John Choi and Stephanie over at the other end. Uh, and uh, Tim O'Malley was very involved initially and then when, once Archbishop Hebda got in, on, on the scene, he was involved as well. But it went from litigation that lawyers on the street thought this is going to last for years 
this may be up in the Supreme Court before this gets resolved, but it got resolved. <clears throat> and it was resolved through a 24-page settlement agreement that is multifaceted. It's a, in, to, in its totality, it's a roadmap for the archdiocese moving forward. Uh, two of the provisions in this very, I would say, uh, creative, sort of out-of-the-box agreement by some lawyers who knew what they were doing, and that includes John Choi and Stephanie uh, Rizma and Tom Ring from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, who's not here, and Joe Dixon, who was representing the archdiocese uh, in the litigation, and of course, uh, Tim O'Malley and the archbishop. But they, <clears throat> rather than staying the course as lawyers, the, the kind of determined <clears throat> type A, we gotta, we've got to get this resolved through this lawsuit here. We'll, we'll, we'll there'll be a winner and there'll be a loser and we're going to be the winner. Well, they, they found a way for both sides to win. And within the context of this 24-page agreement, there's two provisions that relate to restorative justice. And those are the provisions that we're going to focus on today. Before, however, we do that, I'm, just cu I'm curious to know um, from each of you, just what, what were you, what did you know about restorative justice, and what had been your experience when you entered the negotiating, or came to the negotiating table, that, that made you think that, hey, we should, we should put something into this agreement that requires the archdiocese to do something about restorative justice. John, you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to start. So I've had a um, really privileged career to, uh, before I was the county attorney, I was also the St. Paul City attorney, and it was during that time period where I became acclimated to kind of what restorative justice is all about, and more importantly, what it could actually accomplish. So as a city attorney, we did a number of things that would replace the traditional criminal justice system with restorative justice approaches. And oftentimes it's very difficult to exactly put into words uh, what is restorative justice, because I think it can mean a lot of different things in very different contexts. But at the end of the day, uh, what it does provide, I think is um, really a better outcome and that's something in law school that we don't talk about enough is uh, outcomes. And the outcome that we want is justice. And for uh, many of us who practice in the area of um, juvenile justice, criminal justice, um, we don't oftentimes take the moment to stop that assembly line and just reflect on the system that we operate in. Nobody actually that currently works in the system today created that system. In fact, we inherited it from a long time ago. Uh, but we presume and assume that somehow that is the way in which we achieve justice and we get better outcomes uh, for the people that are involved. Oftentimes, it's a, a, there's a victim, there's an offender, but also, too, for the community, because when the prosecutor initiates a criminal complaint, they do it not on behalf of the victim, but actually on behalf of our community. And, um, and but so we have that process and the vast majority of everything goes through something like that when there has been harm done where a law has been violated. Uh, but there are other ways in which we can achieve justice and get better outcomes. And so restorative justice is one of them and it's an area that um, I've been very involved with as a St. Paul t a city attorney and then also just now very, very recently as we're thinking about trying to, um, thinking about a different way to achieve uh, justice in the juvenile context, uh, that we're recognizing that um, sometimes better outcomes can happen when we, when we think outside the box. And so that was my orientation and understanding of it and recognizing that um, the adversarial process in which I found myself uh, with the archdiocese could only accomplish so much. I mean, we were very creative to utilize the civil uh, child protection statute and the criminal um, statute together in tandem, working together. And so we came to some resolutions on the civil side. But on the criminal side, um, quite frankly, if we had continued to proceed, we'd still be litigating right now. 
uh, I would be convinced that we would have gotten a conviction and then that conviction would have been appealed and then it would have just kept being appealed. And at the end of the day, let's just say that we did resolve it and we, the state's interest won in that particular case. At the end of the day, it was a misdemeanor offense. And again, we were, we were prosecuting the corporation and there's reasons why we chose to do that. It helped us get to some of the systemic change that we wanted to see. But at the end of the day, a conviction against a misdemeanor corporation would have resulted in, nobody goes to jail even though under our law corporations are people, but you don't put a corporation in jail, right? And so what it would have been would have been in some term of probation, something along those lines, a fine, and for the most part that would have been it. And no opportunities to think about some of the broader things that the current civil settlement has allowed to uh, take place. But most importantly, as a part of the second revision of that settlement agreement in lieu of us dropping the criminal charges, um, restorative justice can only start and can, can only begin when there's the acknowledgement by the offender uh, that wrong has been committed. And in that, as a part of that process, Archbishop Hebda said out loud and very publicly that they had failed children, that they had put the interests of the institution themselves above the interests of protecting children. And so from there, we can start a process by which we can restore people. It's been great for me to see the journey that uh, the victim's family that were victimized by Curtis Waymire and the Archdiocese in terms of their journey into re reconciliation and forgiveness. And I think it's helped them in many ways. And then of course it wasn't just that family that was victimized. It was the Catholic faithful who put their trust in our institution. And we're told back in 2002 when the Dallas Charter uh, was put together that everything was fine. And it wasn't. And then the uh, par parishioners, faithful, our community, and I would say uh, priests, the clergy, are victims as well. Many of whom uh, the vast, vast majority never ever could do anything wrong. And they're human beings, but I mean, I'm talking about running a fall <laughs> of criminal laws. They're victims too. And so, as a part of all of this, I felt it was really critical to incorporate concepts of restorative justice to ensure that the head of our archdiocese, our archbishop too, was participating in that. And today, I mean, the, I think the provisions of the agreement said only like three, at least three, but quite frankly, Archbishop Hebda and many of the people that have been involved have gone far, far beyond. Um, John, we'll, their, we'll, their, we'll, get, we'll yeah. get to this, yeah. we'll get to okay. this. <laughs> uh, archbishop. What, what, what did you know about restorative justice when you're at the negotiating table? Tom, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I knew, I knew almost nothing. I had at one point when I was in the Bishop, uh, Bishop of Gaylord, I had had a couple approach me about engaging in a restorative justice process, nothing to do with abuse of minors or anything like that. I'd done a little bit of internet search, but I, I didn't pursue that at all. And so really, um, I, I knew little about restorative justice but was intrigued by what uh, Mr. Choi was able to describe about his experience. I was very grateful to uh, Hank Shea here at the university who was speaking to us a little bit about that as we were considering what were our options and uh, very grateful then for the introduction that came to Justice Geske who put, uh, definitely put flesh on the bones on the skeleton of restorative justice. So, even though I knew little about it when it was first uh, suggested, uh, I was intrigued by it, and as I was learning more about it, I became more and more committed. So that, that's where I was, Tom. Okay, good. Tim? Uh, I was in a similar boat. Uh, my recollection is that the, uh, the idea of this concept, and including it, came from John Choi. Um, shortly after that, we knew about Hank's work and Father Dan's work, and they introduced us to Janine Geske, and, and we learned a lot more about it. But really, at that point, my world was centered on um, some of the legal issues, clearly, but then also how to address uh, some of the brutal past, some of the things that happened 
we were investigating those, we were dealing with those, we were working with victim survivors to try and sort some of that out, and then also how to deal with harm moving forward. Looking back on it, exactly what we're trying to do fits with restorative justice, but it, I didn't have that concept in mind. I do think it fits with, uh, as was mentioned earlier today, some of the foundations of the Catholic faith and other faiths, of, of all the things you've heard from the other panels. That does fit together, um, but it wasn't a concept that I had in, in mind at all at the beginning. Stephanie, any familiarity on your part with restorative I, justice when, when, it, when it appears as though John suggested it? I joined the I Knew Very Little Club. Uh, I <laughs> but you came, agreed with your boss. I did. I did what my boss told me to do, <laughs> like a good employee. Uh, he deserves all the credit for the restorative justice in the settlement agreement, but I did come from a background of community organizing and uh, working with communities to overcome problems, so I understood the concepts of restorative justice, and I understood what we were trying to achieve in the settlement agreement. I think what Jean Bishop said about uh, an eye for an eye not being sufficient uh, went to what we were doing, and the aspirational goal that's listed at the top of our settlement agreement is that no child would ever be the victim of child sexual abuse ever again. And to do that, we had to do more than just uh, have criminal justice in the terms of probation or an $18,000 mm -hmm. fine. So the two provisions that are in the agreement, uh, one calls for a day-long conference for restorative justice and healing, or and reconciliation, sorry, day-long conference for uh, uh, restorative justice and reconciliation. And the other provision uh, calls for, or uh, requires the Archbishop to conduct mutually agreed upon restorative justice sessions. And I wanna get this evolve. This question will evolve into a longer discussion, but I, I, I'm just curious. When, when you struck those words and added them to the agreement, did you have any, you know, mutually agreed upon restorative justice session? What, what were you thinking about that might look like? Uh, who wants to take the, take that on first? John, you might, you probably put it up. Put those words out there. Might be at least on the on the on the conference. Um, yeah, I mean, the conference, we're, gonna, we're going to plan that now, and, and part of the, it's, it's changed over time. I, I think we had, like Stephanie mentioned, there's an aspirational goal here, and, and it's 24 pages long. There's a lot that we put in there that we continue to interpret ourselves, to be honest. But the, the, the conference will happen. It's going to be very much a, a victim survivor focused, and it's coming up soon. There'll be another conference that we're, we're going to host here, this Archdiocese in April, that will have hundreds of people here from around the country, and that'll be more on lessons learned, which is part of what we talked about making that, but we've kind of split mm -hmm. it into two. Um, but your first question about, about uh, or the mention of restorative justice sessions, at least from my perspective, I was a little bit new to this, and what we wanted to do was, was set the stage for us to um, prove to each other, or at least give the archdiocese the opportunity to prove to the county attorney and others our sincerity and in our um, efforts to, to correct some wrongs, um, but also to do it in a way that it was measurable in, in somehow. And we said, oh, we, okay, we'll do this restorative justice thing. Well, rather than just say, all right, we'll do it. I think it even says you'll do a certain number within a certain period of time. So it was very specific. And as John mentioned, we, we kept working at that, a lot of people between the two offices, and then that evolved into a much more of a, of a practice that got, got played out in a lot of ways that we might get to this afternoon or not, I don't know. But. Archbishop, I know that you've pretty much set aside Friday afternoons uh, to be available to uh, victim survivors if there are any that want to come to visit with you. Uh, did, is this part of what you consider to be the, 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 the language or implementation of the language in the agreement? And then maybe talk about how those sessions are going. Yes, thank you. So I think initially when I, I still had a little bit of a lawyer's hat on, and when I was hearing about the- Archbishop the, is a graduate of Columbia Law School. Also. When I was hearing about the three sessions that we had committed ourselves to, I was thinking in a much more formal way about facilitated section, uh, sessions. And we had engaged uh, a professor from the University of Minnesota who was able to help us um, with those. But as we engaged in that process and as we came to uh, know more about restorative justice, um, it certainly has, has extended beyond those facilitated sessions to those opportunities to have uh, discussions, to have uh, conversations. And um, 
initially we had said that, I had said that uh, from February through uh, April that I would leave Fridays open, Friday afternoons open for that. And we had a, a good number of people uh, who had, were themselves survivors uh, who would come in to speak. They, that wasn't the first time that I had encountered survivors, nor was it the last. We've had people who have been asking since then, so we, we try to uh, always uh, honor that time. But it's a little bit what uh, Jean Bishop was saying today, that somehow or other when you know the stories, that's what changes everything. And so uh, whether it be in the facilitated uh, restorative justice session or in those opportunities to have somebody uh, share their experience and then to have the opportunity not only for me to listen but also for me to express uh, that somehow or another that takes the whole matter to another level. Because it's not just statistics, it's not just uh, something that I've read about, but it's uh, somebody that I, I can I have shared an experience with that I, I know their stories. We can we can cry together. We can get angry together, and uh, that has really changed the whole way in which uh, we've been able to address not only uh, the immediate uh, difficulties that were before us, uh, but also as we try to plan uh, for moving forward beyond the time that the settlement agreement binds us. So those encounters, and we've really, I feel so blessed by the number of people who have stepped forward to have those discussions um, with me. Um, those encounters have really, I think, had a, a lasting impact on the way in which our archdiocese will be approaching these matters in the future, how it is that we are able to improve what we're doing, and how most especially that our, um, our own um, outreach uh, to those who are survivors, those who have been hurt, uh, will be uh, Im improved or enriched uh, and giving, I think, all of us an opportunity for greater healing. I think all of the panelists here uh, have had an opportunity to sit down with a victim survivor and, and to hear their story. And from that story, you, you very quickly realize just how deep the, the, the hurt, the, the harm is, and, and how trust devastating it is. Uh, and it's, to that extent, it's, it's, it's unique, uh, where you've got not just a, 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 an interpersonal trust that's violated, but you've, you have, the, when that trust is violated, someone's faith can also be violated. And that's really elevating what's happening here to a, to a very unique and, and different level. Based on your experiences, uh, what is your level of confidence that restorative justice will work with victim survivors of clerical sexual abuse, given the depth of the harm, the, extent, the uniqueness of the harm, uh, and maybe you can uh, comment on that. So I think one thing that's really important for people to understand is that uh, we would never ever force a victim uh, to be a part of the restorative justice session, nor would we ever have restorative justice in the context uh, where the offender um, is not at a place where they're recognizing the harm that they have caused. So a big part of, so if we're talking about a very narrow, specific example of how a restorative justice session could work. Oftentimes, we'll think about it in the person who was directly harmed and a, an offender. So for instance, in the case that we were involved with, it would be someone like Curtis Waymeyer and um, uh, the, the family that was involved. I don't think that necessarily that could p possibly take place right now, but maybe it could, mm -hmm. I don't know. And that's not necessarily what this is about, Tom. I think it's important for people to also understand that it goes beyond that, that victims uh, are not just the persons that are directly impacted or the family, but it can also include an entire parish that was harmed. Think about the parish in which this, the context of this abuse occurred. Mm -hmm. There was tremendous harm that was done. So we need to restore that trust was broken, right? It can also be in the context of broader um, populations as well. And so I think the, the, we shouldn't limit ourselves to believe that restorative justice happens in that very 
uh, <coughs> kind of compact way. It can be a very broad way. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to accomplish is recognizing that um, these types of processes can bring healing to victims. So let's go back to this very singular compact example. It can bring healing for those victims who have been directly impacted. It can bring healing so for the those example we're talking about now is the Curtis Waymire. Right, but it could also be that entire parish or whatever it might be. And then also too, it allows for opportunities for the the uh, the, the person who did the wrong to atone for. Uh, those things, and that means so much for victims, and it's also an opportunity for people. See, restorative justice is a lot about listening more than it is about, um, and, it, and it eliminates any type of power differential. And in getting into that type of process, we're really focused on trying to undo that harm, address uh, those harms that have been caused, and help the people heal and come out of that in a better way, <clears throat> a more productive way. Archbishop, Tim, have comments on about, and the question really relates to the depth of the harm that's done and your confidence level that there is a role for restorative justice to play and, you know, taking into account what John just said, that there's different levels, yes. different types, groups of, of victims. You know, I, I wish I could say that after somebody, ha that we have an, a, a restorative justice session that a person is healed. Yeah. And I'm always so grateful for Justice Gesky who talks about it's an ing process right that it's, it's something that that continues into the future um, but it's been my experience that even those encounters and uh, when they go deep uh, that they they open up the possibility of further healing and um, and we, we whether it be in terms of a person's relationship to the church that's often in I, I can't speak to restorative justice and other situations, but often for somebody just to have the opportunity to speak to a representative of the church and to share their story uh, allows them to at least begin to uh, test the waters about their own faith or about uh, going back to church, for example. Huh? Just one little story, there was a, a gentleman who, sh who shared with me and uh, he really had not, um, faced much of the abuse that had happened in his own life. And um, he was waking up in the middle of the night screaming. A married man, uh, adult children. And um, <clears throat> his wife was obviously a little bit concerned because it was something that, uh, that repeated itself. And he, he found himself uh, in therapy, and that was very helpful for him. And that was when he first uh, began to talk, and the therapist helped him to uh, you know, speak with the, his wife. But it wasn't until he was able to talk to a representative of the church that the screaming stopped. <laughs> now, it, it, I mean, for, for whatever reason that's there, and uh, by no means is that, was that the end of the process. Huh? But in terms of it being mm -hmm. a, a, a step, I, I think that's the kind of story that uh, gives us some hope that what we're doing is, is worthwhile. One of the things that's been amazing for me is that uh, there have been so many people who, when they've come forward to tell their story, also commit themselves to wanting to uh, somehow or another improve what the church does, make sure that kids aren't going to be hurt, make sure that we do a better job with outreach. And uh, Tim could speak about the specifics there. But it's phenomenal, the generosity that comes from the hearts of those who have, who have been hurt by the church and who are survivors of that, <clears throat> Who, who then uh, become more engaged in assisting. That doesn't mean that they're, they're necessarily gonna be practicing Catholics. That's not, that's not the aim right there. Huh? But in, in terms of uh, being willing to engage uh, with the church in improving the situation, that's been phenomenal. Uh, Tom, I think the more profound the harm, the greater the good that, come, that can come out of restorative justice. Uh, point one. Point two, I think, is that it's, it's inaccurate, in fact, it's stupid to stereotype and categorize victim survivors. W what's the remedy? We talk about what could happen out of this. Stephanie talked about, yeah, you could have got a misdemeanor conviction and where would we be? W what would actually help somebody and individualize it? Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, well, first, maybe just a quick hypothetical. Imagine you go away for the weekend, right? And you just go, you fly back on Sunday night, you're walking up to your house, you're pulling your suitcase, you're mumbling about the lack of legroom on the airline, and 
You get up to the door and you go to unlock the door and the light's out. And you think, geez, I bought one of those 10-year bulbs. They burn out. This is stupid. You go in, you walk in, you find out you've been burglarized. The house is trashed. You will never be the same again. And there's people that would talk about that being very profoundly harmful to them. Somebody came in their home. They felt invaded. They felt all that kind of stuff. I guarantee you, you will never approach the house the same again. And through no fault of your own. You're going to walk up. You're maybe walk around the house and see if the window's kicked out. You're going to notice if a light is out. You're going to notice those things. Now add that, uh, apply that analysis to sexual abuse of a child and the harm that can result from that. So what's the remedy? You know, we talk about restitution. Maybe you get $10,000 from your insurance company to take care of the jewelry that was taken and, and the electronics. Or maybe the deterrence effect. Maybe, you know, maybe neighbors are more aware, and there's actually a good thing about it. The neighbors feel bad. They're victims in the community, but they're more aware, so maybe they're actually safer today. But what about for a person who was sexually abused and the harm that results from that? And here's the example I'll give you. We had a, a gentleman, uh, and it's in part from the work of, of John and Stephanie, and then also Mike Finnegan in, in Anderson's office. We have a standing offer to any victim survivors that if they want to meet with us, you know, we'll, we'll examine their case. And in, for, the, for the lawyers in the room, in the, in the bankruptcy, if you filed a proof of claim, which has all the information on it, there's a protective order. We cannot even acknowledge that that exists. We would violate the law if we did that. So we can't act on that. So we said, if you want to come in and talk to us, we'll examine it and we'll try to do whatever we can to make it right by you. I don't know what that'll be, but we'll do something. So there's a gentleman, he's 78 years old. And he came to us through his attorney and he met with us and he told us what happened. It was well over 60 years ago that he was abused by everybody in this room, I think, would look at him externally and objectively and say he's very successful. He's happily married. This is an unusual one. He's happily married. <laughs> Just that's unusual. It's, uh, <laughs> he's happily married. He's got a couple wonderful kids. He's, very, he's one of the richest guys I've ever met in my life. He's from out of state. He flew in here on his own plane to meet with us. Okay, so money's not an issue, all that kind of stuff. We meet with him, and he tells us what's going on. The priest's name has not been disclosed at this point. So we said, well, here, here's what I promise you. I, I will listen to you, we'll investigate it, and we'll do what we can, and I'll get back to you. Thank you. We investigate it. We determine that, yeah, this is a substantiated claim under the standards we've established. So about two months later, we call him and say, I want you to know that today we're going to put this priest's name up there. Okay? He's going to go up on our website. We, we owe it to tell you that before it goes up. I know you don't look at our website a lot, but just so you're aware of it. Is the, pri is the priest still alive? The priest is dead. He doesn't do this to punish the priest priest is dead. If, if, if you believe in an afterlife, he's maybe being punished, right? Um, he didn't need the money. He's got money for counseling. He does all those other kinds of things. But he starts crying on the phone. And he says, I, I just have to tell you that after 65 years, and he didn't tell anybody for, you know, 30, 40 years, whatever. He said, after all that time, for me to know that somebody in authority in the church listened uh, didn't automatically believe, but investigated, and then believe me. He said, this is the most peace I've felt mm -hmm. in 60-some years. Um, and very importantly, not only did you, you know, nod and say the right things, which a good actor can do, you actually acted on it. You put the son of a bitch's name up on the website. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, that's an individualized remedy for that guy that cannot come in any other way. And I think that's a, a form of restorative justice. It's not passing the, the talking stick, which I've done with the archbishop, with victim survivors. He acted as the surrogate. I'm mad at the church. You know, a number of victim survivors, I say you can't categorize them. A number of them aren't necessarily mad at the actual abuser. They realize there's an illness, whatever it might be. But how could the church have let this happen? You know, how could, this, how could that have happened? So they wanted a, a bishop to sit there and look him in the eye and talk to him. So those things can all, but there's a lot, there's a wide range of what, what can be embraced by restorative justice and how it can actually help people in some of the worst situations in their life. Thank you. Let, let's go back to the two provisions, um, which were, were quite specific. A day-long conference. <laughs> uh, restorative justice sessions over a two-year period. Um, I think it would be valuable to, and so they were specific. You 
have, have are in planning of the, of the conference. There's been, been sessions. Uh, so that sounds all pretty good under the agreement. But there certainly are many indications that this has gone, and in fact, I know that it's gone further than those two provisions. And, and maybe it would be useful for you to talk, uh, Archbishop and Tim, about how that's uh, evolved, and then for Stephanie and John to, re to respond to, to what you know is going on or have heard now is going on, and whether that's something that you had in mind uh, at the time the agreement was signed or are just you know, happy that has happened. You want to start, Archbishop? Yes, and I, I'll, I'll leave the details to Tim. But um, when we went into some of those difficult negotiating sessions with uh, Mr. Choi and, and his and his team, um, we had in, in the in the forefront of our intention uh, to be able to uh, correct situations that had existed in the past and really to to try to do better. So we that was that we, certainly we wanted to be able to uh, resolve the matters at hand, both criminal and civil. But we also knew that that wasn't enough, that we needed to uh, be willing to do whatever it took to, to change the institution locally in a way that would um, both show our commitment um, to change, but then also uh, actually help the situation. So we, we were hoping as we went into negotiation that if we would show that we were willing to go beyond what we thought that uh, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office would require from us, that that would establish a, a grounds for good faith and that we would be able to um, be able to talk to one another in that way. But in, it, so it wasn't something that was extracted from us, but rather it was a desire to collaborate in a way that would make our system better that mm -hmm. would make children uh, more safe, and that would begin to um, begin that process of bringing justice as well. But that was the um, the mindset, at least, uh, of those uh, from who were um, negotiating on the part of the archdiocese. And 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 Tim can give you some details of how we had already begun some of those processes before that. Yeah, we we had. Uh I think if there's one difference maker, and I'll try to tie this in, Tom, I think it does, is, is the, you know, and, and John Choi, I can recall us having discussions in smaller groups than the, the mediation and the groups when we got together in bigger groups about what is our real goal here, and it was to, to affect an institution, to hopefully change a culture for the better. Um, there was a certain um, secretiveness, certainly, uh, maybe clericalism, you hear, uh, an arrogance, um, how is it that this could have happened in an institution that's a religious, any religion? How could this happen? How, how could people turn a blind eye to it? You know, how, so we started thinking about how can you, you, you change the culture? And I think the one difference maker between years ago and today is the role of laity. Just the role of laity. Not that clergy is important. It's very important. But the partnerships that are developing. And that's going to be the movement that was talked about. That, that's, that's where it's going to come from. Not from an archbishop or one or two other people saying, we mean this. It's going to be a movement. It's going to take hold. And I think that um, uh, the restorative justice efforts that we're going on, meeting with people, developing those relationships, we formed some committees. We've done a lot of different things to, to try and spread that, if you will. Uh, but the royal lady from the very beginning, when you even think of it, at, when the bankruptcy, the criminal, and the civil were resolved, there was really a core group of six people that were there that night until whatever it was at the law firm in Minneapolis until midnight or so. We we're in our separate rooms. We're coming in. There were six people in the in the archdiocese room. There was the archbishop and then five lay people. There was Brian Short and Tom Abood and Karen Roundhorst, three members from the board. Those are the Catholics. That's the church, uh, and that's a different image than people had from the archbishop can do no wrong from. 20, 40, 60, 1800 years ago, right? <laughs> I mean, th th there's a role there, but it's the partnership. It's, it's, the, it's the having different minds around the table rather than all like-minded people just kind of going, yeah, this will be a good. We'll, we'll pray and it's all going to be fine. No, 
No, we need certain expertise, and I think having laity involved at the seminary and restorative justice, um, in some of the outreach programs, uh, in his one-on-ones, when, when he meets with victims, often Janelle Rasmussen from our office meets too, mm -hmm. so that there's a, a safety to it. And, and we, which as an aside, I heard this one time at one of our parish meetings, you know what went wrong? Uh, one of the people got up, there wasn't a mother in the room. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty telling comment, really. It wasn't, I mean, not, but there was, well, Janelle's a mother, <laughs> and, and she's in the room. And, and we she's, hired her. <laughs> yeah, we did, yeah. And, and she's teaching at the seminary. She is part, when I tell people this in other areas of the country, they're kind of stunned. She is not only teaching at the seminary now, she's part of the formation committee to decide if men who are in there are moving forward from year to year and should progress to be priests. It used to be all collars, and that wasn't that long ago. And again, they add a lot to it, but you, you know, they're going to leave the seminary. They're going to go in the real world. We have to prepare them for that. So I, I think the role of laity was the, the emphasis, and I think there is a lot that, that can still continue from that. Stephanie, does what's happening add up for you? I know you've spent quite a bit of time monitoring the agreement and more recently looking at whether or not the changes that have occurred are resulting in, in culture change within the institution. I mean, where, where do you come down on this? Yes, I think the Archdiocese deserves a lot of credit for going above and beyond what was outlined in our settlement agreement. I think that we all knew at the time that we drafted it that it was the floor that we hoped and we thought that the Archdiocese would take it farther than what we outlined in the agreement. I think that whenever we talk about how this came about and what happened and what different ways it could have gone, everyone in the room can acknowledge that if the right people had not been at that table, this would not have happened. And so when we were looking at what do we put into this agreement, we looked at our aspirations and what we were hoping to achieve. We looked at what was best practice, what were other places doing, other organizations, the Catholic Church itself. How could we hold the Catholic Church to its own standards? Um, and then we had to have some sort of confidence that they would take what was put on paper and run with it, and they have, as uh, Tim laid out for everyone. They've done so much more than three restorative justice sessions. I know that um, Justice Geske is going to Assumption tomorrow uh, for a session, uh, if anyone wants to join. <laughs> and, um, have really, and I think you've heard, too, that they've really taken on restorative justice in many different forms. It's not just three listening sessions where folks can come and hear about what happened. You can sit down with the Archbishop. You can go to a session with Justice Geske. Um, there's just many different ways you can go to talks like this. Um, and then the role of the victim coordinator as well. There's an acknowledgement that uh, one person's restoration and healing is not the same for the next person as we go out and we do talk to people about the impact that this has had and whether or not there's been a change there is uh, there's a divide as to whether or not people feel that restorative justice is the answer and so i think the archdiocese is open to hearing that and they're not just putting um, all their faith into the restorative justice aspect john anything to add no i think that was Perfect, Stephanie. Thank you. Really, um, but I, th I think that um, I had an opportunity to participate in, in one particular uh, session at a parish at St. Odelia, which is one of the larger Catholic parishes in my jurisdiction in Shoreview, and, and Father Dan Griffith was a big <coughs> part of that, and uh, Justice Geske. But I have, um, uh, post uh, that session, uh, I know lots of people that go to that parish and that were a part of that particular um, event uh, where they had an opportunity to listen to some speakers and then they went into some discussions at their table uh, that was kind of modeled after a restorative justice model and uh, people took from that um, I think some great comfort um, to have this intentional way that they were going to talk about uh, these things that they had been experiencing as Catholic faithful what people have experienced is that they felt betrayed uh, by their institution, that their faith had been shaken in some ways, and they were very disappointed and hurt in many ways. And so there was opportunities for people to discuss that and for people who needed to hear that to hear that, but then also for uh, the people uh, that 
were in, not involved directly with any of these uh, clergy sex abuse, but just a part of the institution, uh, to also be able to express their sadness and sorrow and, and recognizing that um, what had happened was wrong and that it shouldn't have happened and that we're all committed to kind of wanting to have this change and making this lasting change. Those, that type of dialogue and, and that time and that intentional way to um, talk about that as a community uh, was really meaningful to mm -hmm. a lot of people and so that's a big part of it. I'd be curious to know what, um, w how well you think you're doing, um, first Archbishop and Tim, and sort of uh, walking the line between um, affirmatively providing direction to the healing process and sort of from a kind of a top-down, here, here are the services that we have available versus allowing make, and encouraging things to happen organically within at the parish level or even more broadly within the community. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what your philosophy is on, on walking that line? We, we Catholics are big on both and, right? <laughs> and so we, we certainly want to do what, what we can, resources that we're able to bring or to stimulate thought of, of others. But we've been very grateful for the work that's, that's come out of our parishes as well. Um, we mentioned Father Dan before and the, Got the beautiful the work at Our Lady of Lourdes. Huh? That's where I, I first had the opportunity to hear Jean Bishop, and that was very instrumental for me. But... So you and you, we recognize we had parishes that were stepping forward uh, to be part of some uh, testing as to how we could move forward. It took an obligation, it took a commitment of time on their part. We're very grateful for that. But our hope here, in terms of the philosophy, is to be able to present options, but options that also really empower our parishes uh, to to take things in uh, where they see would be best. Obviously, it's very, very different experience from a place like St. Odelia's or a place, a, a little rural parish um, where you have 80 people in the church on a Sunday. And, and so for the pastor to be able to figure out how it is that we do that is, is significant. But it's not just even coming from our parishes, but also from other groups. We've, we've formed a, a, a body called the, lay, uh, the lab the lay advisory board, they, for example, are very interested in this question. And I, I know that we'll be getting suggestions from them. We're engaging in this process of a synod in the archdiocese. We've had so far four of the large prayer and listening events, and we're getting some ideas uh, from, from that group as well. And I, and I know they're going to continue to percolate. Now, Tim could give more of the details, but where we've really been blessed <clears throat> has been with the collaboration of, of a small group of survivors who have, have, from the very beginning, have been invested in, in helping us to get this right. And so some of the ideas that um, might seem like they're coming from top down were actually ideas that came from them. And uh, we're, we're happy to be able to facilitate that really feel blessed with the, uh, the, the ideas that have come from that group. Uh, Tom, I'd offer two practical thoughts on, on the role we should play in terms of driving this or collaborating or how it should be. One is short term and one is long term. Um, there's two uh, victim survivors in the audience here today who, who we have known now for five years, four or five years, uh, Paula and Frank, um, and I'm not outing them. They have, they're known. Uh, in fact, Paula works for us now. Um, uh, but early on, we met, and, and a group of us started talking about what could we do, and we had these great ideas. And I remember we even planned a couple events, and nobody showed up, right? <laughs> we all dressed up for the prom, and there was no band. It was just nothing. And we thought, what are we doing wrong? Well, part of the problem was nobody trusted the archdiocese. You know, three, four years ago, we said, we need to establish a certain level of credibility if people are going to be involved with us at any way. And we tried to do that through very concrete actions rather than just words. But at the beginning, we could say something, and there were, there were ones who would call other victims and say, listen, who's behind? Is the archdiocese? Well, they're involved. I'm not coming, period. Okay? So short term, there's that practice. Long term, this cannot be run by 
any one entity. We, we have partnered with the government. We have some nonprofits, the Zero Abuse uh, Tolerance, the Zero Abuse uh, uh, Group. We're working with them on long-term solutions on plant. We need to have a lot. Of, we need to have more than 325 people in this room. We need to have this be something that takes hold and it is organic and people do it and we should play a role. We should absolutely play a role. But it, I think it's irresponsible for us to be, in fact, if you go back and you want to start getting to the root causes, we don't have time to do all that, maybe it's that there was an entity or, or a couple of bishops that had too much authority and were driving too much. You know, maybe we don't need a dictatorship. Maybe what we need is a group of people that complement each other and work collaboratively and have a true partnership relationship and then let it take off in that way. Well, I was going to start questions at uh, 2.35, but boy, do I have questions. <laughs> Maybe we should get a running start on it. Well, I'll, I'll ask one of my own, because I think we've got a lot of lawyers in the audience, and, and even for non-lawyers, this, this may be of interest, which is, and they keep coming. Good for you folks. Uh, the, 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 the question is just, is uh, what do you see as the largest challenge from a legal perspective? Uh, to the successful use of, of restorative justice in providing healing and and serving as a as an option for healing to victim survivors of, of clerical sexual abuse. So, are we still dealing with uh, legal challenges here, or have we moved beyond them, John? So I think it's just in the context of not in in the context of the settlement agreement, but more so just Correct. overall in general. So I think the the biggest challenge would be is that you would never want to um, impose restorative justice on anyone that didn't want to do it, because there are people who are have been victimized, and we would be re-victimizing them if we. Um, suggested something that the person was not ready for, and so obviously it should come from a genuine, deep desire of that person to maybe take that journey. And of course, then you have on the other side, it, restorative justice is of no value uh, if the person who was the perpetrator has absolutely no ability to understand that what they have done is wrong or any type of uh, remorse uh, if it's not even possible. I think restorative justice becomes all, well, it, it can't even really start. But when the conditions do exist, and I think a lot of what Jean Bishop was talking about, when your heart is open, um, the highest forms of justice can be achieved. Um, those concepts of love and mercy uh, and the way that God intended us to be uh, can be achieved. And so it's, I guess, it's understanding that um, these conditions can only exist in the right set of circumstances involving the victim and the offender, but when they do, if we have a culture and an openness as a society and as um, people who might be in charge of systems to allow for these things to not necessarily replace traditional systems, but maybe can act alongside of them or after them. And maybe we'll see a world, I know that in Ramsey County we're working on a world where it can replace the juvenile justice system, not in the context of sexual abuse, but in other contexts. But I think as we evolve as human beings, um, uh, those things are possible. But ultimately, the, that's the, I think the biggest challenge, and appropriately so, because I don't think we should ever force this on anyone. Let me, let me ask one of the questions as a follow-up to that, and it's, uh, do you know if there's been any connection found between restorative justice and recidivism? Is there any, any research out there with findings as to whether or not it's, <clears throat> it's helpful? Right, so I, I, there is some data. Um, we've been employing it. I think the Minneapolis School District has done some work, and there's a data that would show that utilizing a restorative justice type of approach uh, would be just as good as doing any type of other uh, response or a diversion. Um, we're working on a, a big project right now in our juvenile justice system, but that's one of the things that we mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are going to be as we launch our project. That's the, the, that's the million dollar question that we actually want to yeah, answer right, and right. actually want to prove that 
uh, you don't have to accept what we inherit uh, as a part of our traditional system, that we can design something different and actually get better outcomes around public safety and uh, uh, justice. Archbishop, <clears throat> I have a question for you. How has hearing people's stories changed you as a person? Yes. Can I go back just one sure. question, though, sure. too, on terms of legal obstacles, and then I'll get to this question, too. You know, one of the things that will no longer be relevant here, but many of you will be working or living in other dioceses that um, might still be addressing these things. And one of the obstacles that was very difficult for us was uh, the bankruptcy litigation. And so um, I think, especially from a number of survivors who have come in since that was resolved, said we really didn't feel like we could enter into that kind of a discussion while the bankruptcy was continuing. So we have to find some way in terms of the system uh, to be able to facilitate those kinds of discussions that the law didn't see, or the law or lawyers, and I'll, I'll let other right. people decide right. which that is, uh, didn't allow at that time. So that would be the first thing. In terms of how I've been personally changed, I mean, I, I think there's just that um, any time that you have an exposure to someone who's willing to share uh, very intimate details about their lives and uh, ways in which they've been hurt, but it so often reflects years of uh, reflection upon an experience, and you just feel so privileged uh, to be able to, to sit with them. Um, I think that always then prompts in me that um, recognition of, of you know, w what each one of us carries in one way or another, and how what's on the surface isn't always what's uh, down deep. And uh, I think certainly in terms of leading a, a, a local church and leading a diocese, you know, just to, to recognize the, the, the severity of the harm that's caused by abuse in a very personal way um, is going to affect any decision that I would make. We, we've been blessed we haven't had to deal with that recently, but whether it be in terms of returning somebody to ministry, um, I'm a lot more cautious now than I would have been as before I started listening to people talk about how an event that took place 70 years ago continues to have a daily impact on their lives, and it's real. So uh, I'm certainly much more conscious of that as a, as a church leader. That might not go to the personal level, uh, Tom, but it's, it certainly goes to, to that aspect. But, but just uh, always recognizing that uh, those experiences bring to light the complexity of, of human life and, and how things aren't always exactly what they seem and how little decisions that we make can have such a huge impact in someone's life uh, for good or for ill. And that's not just in terms of somebody who's physically abusing, but also the way in which a church responds to somebody who comes forward with a, a claim. That uh, I'm always amazed that people can tell me exa the exact words that they heard when they first came <clears throat> forward, right? Something that's etched in their brain, yeah. and um, yeah. that's, that's pretty uh, grave. Tim, did you have a comment? Well, I had one, one comment on the, on the earlier question about what obstacle could there be in, in law or lawyers. Uh, and while I agree with, with you can't let uh, bankruptcy or adversarial nature of some proceedings, we've got to figure out how to still do restorative justice in that regard. Um, uh, and, and, and John's talk about the system not necessarily embracing research justice. But I talk from a broader perspective of keep in mind the role of attorneys. Um, uh, they're tools. It's all they are. They're not the decision makers, you know, and I'm speaking to, law, to the law students in here and attorneys and those who are going to hire attorneys. Um, it's not a win to write the most persuasive brief, uh, brief or, or to win a motion. You know, that, What's your real goal here? What are you listening to your client about? And we made some decisions early on, as did, did John and Stephanie on both sides of this, that were very non-traditional. There was an easy path. I shouldn't say an easy path. There was a traditional path that each of these two men could take. And they showed some real wherewithal, some real leadership to not just take that. They wouldn't have been criticized. And there's a chance we'd be before the U.S. Supreme Court right now. I mean, that, that would have been the predictable way to go. One of the very early decisions we made, we had attorneys come in and interviewed them. 
and, and some well-known, reputable, very talented attorneys, in, in, in simplistic terms, their answer was, paper the hell out of them. You know, file motion after motion. Take them out of their comfort zone. This is the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. They don't deal with bankruptcy. They don't deal with First Amendment constitutional religious issues. Um, they don't deal with corporate law that much. They mostly charge individuals. We could fight this. We can win this. We could win this. We At what loss, though? So we ended up hiring Joe Dixon, who was a very talented attorney in all those arenas. But that wasn't the goal, to win that one motion or to win that one thing. It was something that John brought up with and the whole pattern. So don't, let, don't break the law <laughs> and, and don't not listen to the advice of attorneys. But the law isn't designed to be an obstacle. There's often ways, if you open your mind to it, that you can stay within the law and still accomplish a lot of good things. And you can listen to an attorney, but it's your decision, not your attorney's decision, as to what you want to do. And if there's any future prosecutors out there, the duty of a prosecutor is not to merely seek convictions, but it's to seek justice. We are ministers of justice and to achieve positive and good outcomes for our public. Stephanie, do you have anything to, to add on to the legal <clears throat> the challenges? I've, I threw the question out, and then I'm, John answered it very well, and then I, I'm, I'm in the sea of questions here. I went on to the next question without, without allowing others to comment. What do you have to say? I think it's been answered very well. I just think it's a, it's a tool in the toolbox, and you have to be willing to be creative. There's no statute that's going to prescribe it, so you have to be willing to think outside of that and think creatively within the law. Archbishop, there's a number of questions that in one way or another relate to um, how are things here being affected by what might be going on in the Vatican or um, with the uh, Conference of Bishops that may impact you know, what you can do or can't do going forward. <laughs> Any quick thoughts on that? And, and also, just there's a, uh, there was a question on just what's your responsibility or authority now vis-a-vis other dioceses, either within Minnesota or Minnesota, North and South Dakota. Great. So we, we certainly have enough work just dealing with our archdiocese. Huh? So that's, that, that has to be my, my first priority. <coughs> At the same time, as part of a larger church, we realize that we're, there's an impact on us by uh, legislation that affects the whole world, universal legislation that would come from Rome and then also um, legislation that might come from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in pretty specified areas. And so our um, response, my response, uh, along with Bishop Cousins, has been uh, both to um, engage the tools that are uh, handy for us to be able to have some impact, especially at, at, with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, sharing a little bit our experiences, for example, and speaking about um, things that have seemed, have seemed to have borne good results here. And I, I think that um, we continue to look for those opportunities on the national level. We don't have so much of an opportunity to do that uh, internationally, um, but we certainly are, are very, um, I think the work that we do here in, in uh, the conference uh, does have an impact. And so, um, as the legislation that came out from Rome in June concerning um, accountability measures for bishops very much reflected the, um, the presentation that was given by an American bishop speaking at a conference in February in Rome. So I, I think there is that opportunity to have some impact, um, but it's much more, much more indirect. I'm very grateful that I have a very talented staff and a number of people around the country have been watching what's, what they have been doing, whether it would be uh, in, in, the, in Tim's office or our uh, Chancellor for Canonical Affairs, our Chancel Chancellor for Civil Affairs are here, the work that they're doing, and they're, they're inviting them to be part of panels like this and to, to speak about creatively about how we as a church might be able to address these matters. So even though my focus has been very much here in uh, the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, you have Tim or, or Susan, who, Susan Moharan, who have been speaking in a much broader, to a much broader forum and who have had an impact in that way. Some quest questions that might lend themselves to quick answers. Have circles among priests been considered? 
You were leaning. Well, no, I, 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 want, I didn't hear what you said exactly. Have, have circles what? Circles among priests. Has the restorative justice for <clears throat> priests been considered? Yes. Do let me just uh, speak. Uh, uh, Justice Geske came a few weeks back, and we had an event just for priests. And so it was, and that, of course, is just the first step as well, a kind of model for how that might happen. It was a, a smallish, maybe 20 priests who, who came and took part in that. I was really pleased with that, and it was a very moving experience uh, for the priests who were there. And Tom, as you've reflected, they've, been, they've had an impact in their lives through right. all of this too. Right. So it, it has been tried, and it considers to be uh, something that's contemplated. Next question with a quick answer. Has a restorative justice process been created in the archdiocese for the healing of an entire parish? And then they cite the, the Weimar Parish, Blessed Sacrament. Yeah, we, we've had a number of, uh, well, with, with the Waymire victims themselves, a number of us, including the Archbishop and myself, have met with the victims and with the victim's mother um, in, in a, I wouldn't call it a formal restorative justice, but along those lines. And then we've probably held, I don't know, at least 10 that you've been at, uh, that Justice Geske's been at, and, and the Archbishop and I have been probably at another 10 parishes where we've had some type of a session about the history, what's happened, where we're at, and how restorative justice plays a role in the future. So there's, there's got to be 20, 25 parishes that have been directly requesting that. And we've put together sort of a menu of options for parishes and for victim survivors to get involved, if they want. It's all out there. And like the Archbishop said, we went, went to one in a small farming community, and we talked about uh, that Canvas Health was available to them, that anybody who might want to talk to them in the the guy came up at the break, a couple of 78-year-old farmers, both of them, and they said, you know, we're farmers. We don't go to counseling. I said, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> we just go out and work. All right, if that's your way to do it, that's your way to do it. But, but we, we lay those options out to people. For some, something's good, something else is good, and we're just trying to, to give those options to address individual parishes, also depending on what's happened at their parish. Waymire is a, a good example. And there's a couple other parishes where there were priests who were notorious who were repeat offenders, and that has had a great effect. St. Odelia with, with uh, some of the Croziers. So we addressed that very specifically at that parish. You know, just on the, the, the family of the, the, the victim family at Blessed Sacrament, one of the greatest joys that I've had is to get to know that family and to see their journey uh, around their own healing. It's not to say that it was necessarily because of uh, any particular restorative justice session, but it was an orientation towards the fundamentals around restorative justice and just um, it's been a complete joy to see just the healing that's yeah. um, uh, starting and, and, and getting better but it's not never will ever be completed uh, but um, but it's an orientation that can achieve those things in terms of the healing for for victims does the church plan to keep the restorative justice methods as part of their culture after the interaction with Mr. Choi and Stephanie Ann. Um, I think the, the real key here is when the court's jurisdiction <laughs> ends, which is February 1st of 2020, so it's coming up in a few months. Sure, I, I'm happy to answer that one. It's, it's yes. <laughs> and um, we can see that. So what we're doing now is we're trying to put in the building blocks so that that's, that's going to be a, a long-term um, tool for us to address I issues. And certainly we, uh, we see that in this area of uh, sexual abuse of minors by, by clergy or, or church personnel, but we see all kinds of other opportunities. And so we've had uh, Justice Geske speak as well to our uh, lay ecclesial ministers. So I think that makes a, a much broader application. We've had her speak to our staff at the archdiocese. So it's just teaching the tools that we think will will continue to serve the archdiocese and and the, not in terms of just the structure, but the people of the archdiocese uh, far beyond beyond um, the termination of the settlement agreement. So when that uh, settlement agreement was first entered into back in December of 2015, and then amended again in the summer of 2016, uh, so it's been in place for a really long time. And it's been a long journey of um, really trying to ensure that the promises that were made in the settlement agreement uh, were fulfilled. And uh, I can tell you that you know the, the archdiocese are, is well on their way of you know 
doing right by every one of those promises. But the more important thing is about embedding that cultural change. And if we had to kind of focus on like what is the overall theme of what we were trying to accomplish in the settlement agreements, it's really a big part of it is the engagement of uh, lay people in the church as a part of how a, the archdiocese would make decisions about clergy who had uh, run afoul of certain policies, et cetera, and, and that concept uh, I think has very much um, been uh, furthered and it's a part of uh, this, these restorative justice sessions, but these are really values and principles that have are developing as a part of the archdiocese and I have absolutely no doubt that these things are going to continue and so as we get close to the end date um, for the settlement agreement which is February of uh, 2020 and uh, we're working on uh, really kind of wrapping up that work but I think another fundamental principle is that it's at, it's at cooperation with civil authorities as well that's very much alive and well and so we've developed a relationship where certainly we're going to continue to work on things uh, together and we'll be talking about that more as we get closer to that uh, end date for the settlement period. A couple of quick questions and Frank, uh, uh, I'll ask you to come up. One, one and this, these are the last two, so they, we've got to be quick here. Uh, but we've moved to a lot of these questions, but there's still a lot here. Uh, there's a question about, was there a definition of restorative justice that people were working from? And if so, what is it? Um, I don't think there is one in the agreement, but was there some discussion at the negotiating table about what we meant by that? Or, you know, is it pretty much, you know, what has been talked about throughout the day, which it, where there's a lot of, a lot of different forms it takes? John Choi had all the leverage. <laughs> we, he thought it was a good idea. I didn't know a lot about it, but we embraced it at the time. And we were We've learned. And we and we it was a part of a journey to kind of define what that meant. There are obviously some uh, understandings of generally what it meant, but I think it's a work in progress. Right. The last question is: What is the role of the clerical sexual abuse ombudsman, and is it a condition of the settlement? <laughs> I am the, cler the ombudsman for <laughs> clerical sexual abuse. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a provision in the settlement agreement as well. Uh, I believe it came from John Choi. Is that right? More Tom Ring. Tom Ring, yeah. all right. But it came, yeah. uh, and it provides for the creation of an independent person to serve as an advocate for clerical sexual abuse victims if they want to seek advice about how uh, they're perceiving a problem and whether it, it is an, uh, there is an issue with how things are being addressed, uh, what could be done to, to ch change that, uh, to, if they're seeking counseling to help get counseling, etc. Uh, and then the, the last question is, and how is that going? Uh, it, it is one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career. Um, you know, the Archbishop and has, has spoken to just how meaningful it is for him to sit down with, with victims and um, it's hard, to, you know, many of you have done that and so you, you have a sense for it, but it is really hard to grasp um, how uh, emotional it is to, be, to have a person <clears throat> lean into you and say, that I haven't told anyone. Um, so, Tom, can I answer that question? Yes. So, just a little bit, because you you can't toot your own horn, but you've you've done a, f a fabulous job of that, and and in just the way in which you you keep my feet to the fire, and 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 my offices as well, is I think uh, very important. But you're always bringing um, your own perspective, and uh, really that that interest in justice that makes all the difference. Uh, we asked the question before was, you know, are we, have, are we having an impact beyond maybe in the archdiocese? And at least with the diocese in um, Minnesota, uh, North Dakota, and South Dakota, we've talked about, in particular, about the way in which Tom has been the ombudsman. And we, we recognize that it was something that was required for us, but how that's really served. So um, I think that that's a, an idea that will... 
uh, continue to gain traction if we can only find more Tom Johnsons. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. And now, uh, Frank, would you like to come up and, and uh, give us some, uh, some of your thoughts on how restorative justice and, and other healing processes, uh, from your perspective as a, you know, a, very, a person steeped in the work in, in, of victim survivors, Frank is the cha uh, president of the Minnesota chapter of, of uh, SNAP and, and does a phenomenal job. He oh, volunteers a lot of thanks. time. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, SNAP, S-N-A-P, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, uh, although we're much broader than that in these days, we hope. And I want to focus a little bit on SS, SNAP Survivors Network. Notice it doesn't say victim survivors. And uh, I heard that earlier this morning, that uh, in many people's minds, victims and survivors is a synonymous term. Uh, that ain't necessarily so. I will use a small example, if I might, that this happened uh, the other day uh, to tell you, to see if you can see the difference between a survivor and a victim. So this is from my friend, and she says, hey, Frank, this is, I need help. I can't believe I let my secret out. And that's what we, that's what we suffer with, the crushing shame, the fact that I carried that around for 40 years. Who am I going to tell? We were trained to go to our church for help. I went to them. I got nothing. I'm going to tell my wife how embarrassing. What am I going to stand like? kids? I'm going to tell my three kids I let this guy do what? I could have walked away. I could have done all these things. Well, at least now from this, you can tell she's about to transition from victim to survivor, right? So here's the rest of the message. I can't believe I let my secret out. It's destroyed my life. I'm shit-faced. I want to die. And that's one of the gals that, that I work with. That's, it's still out there. If you think it's gone, it is not gone. So what did I listen to today and hear a little bit about? Well, restorative injustice. Restorative to me means to put back. So you're going to fix it. And I think Tim talked about that with the, with the burglary thing. I think of that the same type of thing. You come home, your house is burned down. They build you a new house, everything's fine. It is not fine. It's never going to be fine. So what about justice? Well, justice is treating people with respect. And, you know, Dean uh, uh, Vischer this morning said, in early law, we were taught, you know, they don't talk to the victims. You get to the facts, you do the thing, but you don't talk to the victims. And that's what we ran into with the church. We were victimized originally, and almost everyone that I work with tells the same story, says, look, it was bad enough that he did that. But when I went to the church, when I went to the bishop in my diocese, when I went to, they told me, they're there, everything is going to be all right, and they sent us on our way, and that was, we were re-abused right then and there. And that was worse. So what are we trying to work on today? Well, hopefully, um, we t I talked about today about the culture, and we are the culture. We're the culture, and culture dictates our response, right? So we made the culture that allowed this to happen. We allowed this organization, and we allow it just as we are with our government. We allow these organizations to exist, and then we bemoan what they're doing. But we are those organizations, and unless we take some responsibility, and several speakers talked about that today, it better, you better be in there. If you're not walking the walk with them, if you're not, then you can't be talking the talk either. If you haven't been to jail, then don't tell me about what it's like to be in jail. Don't tell me about sentencing, 30, 60, 90 days. Remember somebody said, nobody is asking you anyone, of course, to go walk the victim's role. Why don't you go out and get abused and see what it's like? Can't do that. But you can listen, and that's what we wanted. And that's what we asked of our church, and it never happened. It's finally happening now. You've got to think of where we were five years ago. Chaos. 
you or know anything about what was going on in the diocese, it was chaos. Three years ago, a group of us met, had a little lunch over at the chancery, and we said, what can we do? Where can we go? What can we put together? Can we do anything? We don't even know what restorative justice is. What are we going to do? We never really envisioned this today, but this is a product of what we did. We left that day, and I'm not even sure we, we had a resolution, but we had some ideas, and we had some knowledge, and we had some will. So, and I was one of the people that wanted to be a part of it. Now, I think Tim asked me that. What, what, what are you in it for? And I said, I'm in it to change it. I'm in it because I, I, I'm, I'm going to bitch about it. You can bet on that. You're going to hear me. I'm going to, and I, you can ask the bishop. <laughs> I, you know, I'll, I'll complain, but I also want to be part of the solution then. And I think, I think I speak for most of our SNAP members. So I think restorative justice demands that we be involved. I know in AA, 12 steps, right? You, you, you're not really considered to make those steps until you reach out to someone else. That's what you have to do, or you're not going to be healed. That's what they, they've been preaching that for years, what, 50, 100 years almost, with, with when Bill started that organization. So the organization in this case is the church, and just we, by reaching out to victims, we can get the job done. And I think we've started that. And that's another thing I told the bishop a long time ago. I said, you can't pray. You know, the Catholic response is we write a candle, we make some smoke, and we ask the Holy Spirit to come down and fix what the hell we're doing. But until you get off your ass and do it yourself, it ain't going to get done. And that's what I hope that we're doing, and that's what I hope you guys will be a part of as well. So we've got to walk this walk, and this process is slow. But you've got to remember church years. In church years, they talk about things like, well, it's only 400 years since, we, since he made that statement, so we haven't really acted on it yet. So three years are you kidding we're talking about we've been in the church we've only been going on this for about a minute that's where we are so we're making progress and i think uh, i think this is a model that's going to be sold around the united states and around the world i believe that these guys will tell you they've been the media people go what what are you doing no kidding wow and you talk to the enemy that's us <laughs> you, yeah we do that's what that's what Jeannie bishop talked about you want to, you get the victim and the, yeah, that's the idea. And that's called healing, folks. So I, my message is this. We got to walk this walk together. It's important, it's possible, and it's demanded. Thank you. Frank, thank you very much. You know, it's, it's one thing to get up in a, a healing circle, which is done in confidence, and to talk about these things. It's another thing to get up in front of a large group of people, and I, I salute your courage, and I thank you for it. Um, I think there may be other victim survivors in the audience, and I hope that you took to heart um, Tom Johnson's role. Uh, he's independent, he can speak to you in confidence, and he's a, a accessible, uh, for your needs. So if there are such people, please do get in contact with, with Tom. Um, there's, there's much food for thought, I think, that we've been able to share today. Uh, we hope you'll continue uh, to stay with us if your schedule permits to join in the uh, wine and cheese reception and continue the, uh, the discussion. Tom uh, told me there's quite a number of questions that uh, he was not able to get to, and uh, we'll have people uh, available to you uh, to answer in person, ideally. Um, one other program note, uh, Stephanie mentioned this, but for those of you who want to experience a healing circle, uh, there is an opportunity tomorrow. So at Assumption Church in St. Paul, Janine Geske will be leading a restorative justice program that will include individual healing circles. And it starts at 9 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. There are plenty of other opportunities. Father Dan Griffith has been doing them on a regular basis. His new title is the liaison for restorative justice here in the Archdiocese. And he'll be working with uh, Paula Kempfer in providing all sorts of opportunities for people to do it um, through, through the, uh, the months and I hope years to come. So uh, if you go to a healing circle, 
I can guarantee it's something you will not ever forget. Um, thank you to all our speakers today. Thank you to our, our panel in particular here. It was a, a great way to end the day. And thank you uh, for joining us.